Thank you very much for coming to the, uh, this session. And to us, it's just unbelievable. It's like a bliss that you so generously agreed to talk to our students for three hours. Is it a mm -hmm. dream? Yes, three <laughs> hours, that's right. And Thank that you. would mean that it's to five uh, plus five, uh, five after five this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, your generous support for our program. Uh, probably you have already seen the questions on the Slido. Mm -hmm, yes. About 48, I think. So yeah. um, because the questions are limited and the students are limited, I wonder what's the best way for you to um, handle this session? Usually it's uh, democratic, meaning that people uh, should vote for each other's questions on Slido, such that the uh, question with the most number of likes will automatically float to the top, whereas the latest questions uh, will have a chance to be seen at the bottom of the screen. So if you scan the QR code or manually go to slido.com slash 913, uh, you will see the current 53 questions, but none of which have any votes. So uh, usually I ask the classmates to start voting uh, and uh, before long, we will have the top few questions floated to the top uh, so that we can uh, have a, a conversation around the topics that I already know there's maybe five, maybe 10 people already uh, willing to get an answer from. Wonderful. Um, so students, would you please uh, start voting? Yes. And then mm -hmm. let's give them- That's right. You can vote for your own questions. You should do at least that. <laughs> okay, so start a voting. And please keep the questions coming. Uh, I will always uh, pay attention to this latest question uh, slot. So if you have anything you would like to add to the conversation before I move on, please feel free to post it in the latest questions. And in the case that I missed it, I'm sure that all of you have a microphone. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself also uh, and also just add to the conversation. Um, yes, thank you very much. And the problem, as you see, that uh, uh, most uh, students wrote their names there, uh, mm -hmm. which means that uh, you know who uh, asked the question, and mm -hmm. the the person may uh, follow up your. Answer. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and currently, uh, we have. Uh, two questions tied uh, for the first place with three votes each. Um, do you, uh, Professor Guo, have a preference? Which one should we begin with? It's up to you. You choose whichever you like to answer okay. first. Please. Awesome. All right. So um, without further ado, let's just dive to the questions, if that's okay with you. Yes, please. Ah, and, and, and there is a tiebreaker now. We have a clear top one. I've been waiting for this. So four people. Um, asked, and this question is from Yusuke Kumaki, uh, is electric voting likely to be introduced in politics in the future? And do you possibly have any vision about that? In Taiwan, we already use internet for voting for budgets. We call it participatory budgeting or PB. Um, and we also use quadratic voting uh, to determine which SDG sustainable development goal to focus on each year uh, through the presidential hackathon. And there's many uh, jurisdictions uh, such as the Taipei municipality that use the iVoting platform to collect petitions from the citizens and the national level also through the joint platform. We also have this electronic signature collecting. Now, the petitions participatory budgeting, presidential hackathon, and so on. These um, have one commonality. It's voting for issues, voting for priority. It's not voting for representatives. It's not voting for a mayor, for example, or for a president. And for that, we're still using uh, ballots made in paper. And the reason why is in Taiwan, the tallying process is a public festival uh, there's many people uh, who took their phone, their camera, and so on, 
uh, and participate in the counting process. They do not have to belong to any particular party. They could be a civic journalist, for example, but still the tallying process has maximum accountability because each time each uh, vote is counted, there's three, five, many uh, cameras in the audience filming everything. So uh, people believe the tallying process integrity a lot. And it's also very participatory. It's like a celebration of democracy. Now, imagine the same thing uh, cast through the mayoral or the presidential ballot, but counted purely electronically. Well, there are still ways to verify that, uh, usually mathematical and cryptographic ways to verify that. But until such a day, that each individual civic journalist feel that they understand the underlying cryptography uh, to verify it, people will feel it's a relative loss to a witnessing uh, counting ceremony that they can participate. So in Taiwan, we do introduce electronic voting, but only on the places where no existing paper ballot exists. So for example, the Referendum Act, uh, which, of course, gets people voting on national level issues. Uh, these are not voting for people. There's no risk of one uh, rigged election uh, getting exponential return because the voted in president or mayor will then install even more changes right to the election process. So for referendum, which although there was already a few uh, national referenda, uh, still the number is few in Taiwan. So there's still a chance to change the counting norm. But for voting for president or the legislators, the norm is such that people would demand maximum accountability and transparency until such a day where we can uh, include the same uh, sort of participation in the counting process. I do not envision in the short term uh, our digital voting will replace such means that we may, uh, may make for example, the collection of signatures easier online. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. All right. So um, if there's any follow up, uh, please just unmute yourself. Otherwise, I will move onward. So three people, uh, along with Kotalo Tanaka Sang, uh, would like to know what should be the role of private digital platform providers such as Facebook or Twitter in preventing harmful disinformation. So this is like asking what should be the role of private nightclub or dancing club owners uh, in preventing harmful noise, right? Uh, acoustic pollution. Um, so uh, it has exactly the same structure. So of course uh, it can be answered in three different ways. One is that the patrons uh, although, of course, there is a room, of course, for the uh, nightlife for for uh, making sure entertainment uh, is uh, part of our lives. Uh, still, the patrons, if they visit a place where it causes a lot of noise pollution to the nearby residential area, uh, the patrons can choose uh, which nightclub to go to, right? One would uh, likely to go to some place that doesn't meet the protest of the local uh, zoning council. That's the, the first one. And on the second case, uh, the owner, the operator themselves can invest uh, in, for example, soundproof um, construction so that uh, even though it's very loud uh, inside, it doesn't pollute uh, the environment outside and so on. Of course, that's also worth investing. But finally, there also need to be a commonly accepted like minimum standard for pollution and uh, anything that uh, exceeds such a pollution level need uh, there need to be a independent audit and based on the independent audit, it could be fined, for example, by the community council or by the municipal government, uh, unlikely by the national government. I think in Taiwan, those fines for environmental pollutions are mostly handled uh, on the uh, district or uh, city or municipal level. Uh, but if it's very serious, if it has a global um, kind of um, harm, then of course the national government may at some time uh, step in and say, yeah, simply don't do that. So um, I, I think the key here is not to say that uh, they should shut down their business. 
just for polluting the environment. There need to be uh, viable alternatives that let all the patrons see it is actually possible to, to have fun without causing pollution. Uh, and in Taiwan, there is uh, such a community, uh, what we call the counter disinformation self-regulating body. There is a court and many different operators of social media platform signed on that accord. But in addition to the usual suspects, I believe the first um, entity to sign is the PTT, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, except it's not, it's uh, not for profit. It's subsidized entirely by National Taiwan University for the past 25 years. It's open source, the code is open, the governing mechanism is entirely participatory. It doesn't have any advertisers nor shareholders. So there's no perverse interest of you know pushing more harmful disinformation just to engage uh, the, the clicks and the advertisement fees because the PTT doesn't thrive on this sort of things. And so they sign on the accord first and contributed meaningfully to uh, many innovative designs uh, within that accord that allows people, for example, during the election to see that uh, all the paid sponsored uh, messages, uh, who does that come from? It must only come from domestic sources, how many people did it touch, uh, and things like that, uh, and set a standard. And then based on the standard, the social sector, the communities can then turn to Facebook to see, look, um, obviously it's possible to do so because PTT has done so with a fraction of your uh, operation expense. And if the Facebook does not uh, implement the same radical transparency proposal, for example, of during the election on sponsored advertisements, then they will face social sanction. That is to say, people will uh, refuse to post advertisements there and so on. And which is why in 2019, Taiwan became the first jurisdiction in which that Facebook operated in such a way. Uh, and that's thanks to the social sector's pressure, not because we passed any national level laws. And if you look at the um, tobacco industry, the liquor industry, many other industries with externality you will see a very similar shape where the social sector took the lead, established the norm, and the public sector simply amplifies this need for a norm uh, from a few um, conscious uh, practitioners, social entrepreneurs that prove that it is actually possible to take care of the purpose while perhaps earning a profit. I hope that answers the question. Cool. So any follow-ups? If not, I'll just move on. So, four people would like to know uh, from Yusuke Kumaki song what it is like to be a minister at that young age. I'm 40 now, I'm not exactly young, I'm middle aged, but is there any ad anything advantages and disadvantages about being young uh, in a government? Well, this is a great question. Uh, I do think myself as middle aged, as in connecting the younger generation and the more senior generation. And I often call myself a digital migrant, a digital immigrant, meaning that I'm not born with the internet. I'm born with papers and pencils and so on. Uh, it's not until I was 12. Uh, did I discover the internet and um, immigrated uh, into the internet? So I'm not a digital native, but that means uh, that I have the vocabulary of the senior generation, but I also have, because I'm a young immigrant, have a near native grasp of the internet culture with its open innovation and so on. So um, I believe uh, intergenerational solidarity uh, is the key and it's not particularly about me being especially young. It's just that I can uh, speak the language of both generations. That's probably the advantage. Now, the disadvantage of being young in the government is that Taiwan, just like Japan uh, or other uh, East Asian jurisdictions, um, Korea comes to mind, um, we, we uh, very much respect seniority. So if uh, on the same end of uh, on the same issue, there's a valid point to be raised, uh, a younger person will almost by default not raise it if the senior person already have uh, a take on it and is feeling uh, you know, very good about it. It's very unlikely that a junior person will come up and say, I, I think you're all wrong, right? So, but, but that is part of the many of the Western democracies, they, they thrive on it. So 
how do we make sure that uh, the younger people have a equivalent voice uh, to unmute themselves, so to speak, uh, during this multi-stakeholder conversations? Well, uh, by giving them positions uh, in Japan as well as in Taiwan, we do respect the socially approved official ranks even more than the seniority. So if someone has the title of the digital minister or in our cabinet level uh, youth advisory council, they have this um, mark of being a a youth advisor, a cabinet advisor. Now, if they are a cabinet advisor, then even if they're just 19 years old or 21 years old, people listen to them because people respect this position uh, more so than people defer to seniority. So my main suggestion is that to invent titles uh, to your reverse mentors, to your uh, young participants in your uh, high level decision making uh, process. If there's no existing titles, you can invent one like chief innovation officer or something. Uh, and then uh, people will feel that, oh, there are our peer and we should speak on a peer to peer fashion, not a senior to junior fashion. I hope that answered the question. Why? People would like to know, along with uh, Guo Nan Yen, uh, that Nan Yen, <laughs> that's you, right? Yes, yes just call me Nan Yen. Uh, would you like to? Would you like to explain your questions, maybe? Yes. Uh, did your famous tactics of humor over rumor work mm -hmm. during the second wave? That's right. Because we really saw people were panic and the empty shops, that's forgetting right. the sense of humor. So yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, the second wave, are, are you referring to uh, May this year? Yes, yes. Right. So uh, it's really Taiwan's first real wave, right? <laughs> because previously we, we did have uh, panic buying and we did have runs for tissue papers and so on, uh, but, but the virus didn't really change. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a wave of panic that if you refer to that as a first wave, but it's not a, a wave of virus. Now, uh, the humor over rumor is just one tactic within the larger framework of fast, fair, and fun. And humor over rumor, of course, is an example of fun, like making sure that people can contribute while getting uh, instant gratification. But humor is not the only way to gain instant gratification. Uh, in May, just uh, three days after we announced national alert level three, uh, that's to say the for real, right? Uh, for real, the first wave. Uh, just three days afterward, we introduced the 192 to SMS contact tracing system. Previously, people have to write their names, their contact numbers on a piece of paper because, uh, before going into public venues. But now, if you're using an iPhone, you don't even have to unlock the phone. You just swipe left into the camera, scan the QR code, hit send, and that's it. So that's like two seconds of work. Uh, and soon uh, there's many dedicated QR code scanners like the uh, Bluetooth enabled Taiwan social distance app. Uh, it's like the Cocoa uh, from Japan that's also introduced uh, within May. So although they're not strictly speaking humor, uh, they are fun. They are, they are, um, there's a certain gratification uh, to complete a, a complex checking uh, method uh, with just um, two seconds and no uh, fees paid. Of course, the fee is absorbed by the government, but it's just 0 0.013 NT dollars. So <laughs> a very low uh, price to pay for, for each check-in uh, from the taxpayers. So um, with that uh, into a habit, we did not need to dictate contact tracing uh, fill in forms in any form, either QR or paper, uh, as a top-down national dictate. In, indeed, we originally introduced 192 SMS only to track the uh, high-speed rails and the Taiwan rails and other public transportation system, including the taxis. It's the 2 million and counting individual small vendors and venues and their friends just uh, voluntarily printing out those QR codes. So there's a, a certain humor in it because uh, initially we just designed with a QR code with a CDC, the Center for Disease Control logo uh, in the middle. But I remember many uh, individuals uh, made those third party QR code printers uh, that have cute cats uh, on, the, uh, on that uh, side or cute dogs, um, some cute animals, uh, and also a lot uh, 
uh, like don't panic um, vocabulary uh, around the QR code and so on. So people can just enter their uh, serial number, their randomly generated number and get a very cutely printed, I believe uh, the convenience stores family port and 7-Eleven also joined before the end of May so that you can just uh, with a single click from your phone uh, transfer into a QR code printed from the kiosk iPhone machines uh, and the family port machines in the convenience store. And that's also a lot of fun. So I, I do believe human over rumor generally works, but for this time for the contact tracing, it's not a single poster, but rather a participatory action that people find uh, gratifying. And before long, uh, we shortened the contact tracing from previously requiring almost 24 hours to trace the 28 days uh, contact history. Nowadays, it's real time, like within a couple of seconds, a contact tracer can call out that entire uh, contact tracing check-in system history, of course, uh, with full accountability and audit. Thank you very much. All right, so um, let's move on. So seven people would like to know, uh, actually there is a follow-up, let's tackle the follow-up. So uh, obviously the check-in system, the 192 SMS system requires a lot of trust to manage private information uh, because it's essentially your, your entire whereabouts, right? Uh, to visit an, each and every venue. Uh, so is this a positive trait? It should should it be encouraged even with regime change in the future? So um, I, I need to first explain that the government does not receive the check-in messages. The entire point of a contact tracing system is you can choose to place the check-in at a place that you already trust the most. So if you trust a venue instead of your telecom, you can, I don't know, hand them a name card and that counts as a check-in. Uh, or write your contact number. Or if you trust the uh, telecom of your phone more than you trust the government, then you can actually check in to the telecom by sending to the 1922 SMS. That's the default. And it's placed in the telecom, not any city government. If the government wants to uh, use that information, you can look up on the SMS.1922 website uh, it, all the um, contact tracing costs from the uh, each municipality's uh, health and welfare department, and you can see exactly how many such costs are there to get your checking information. So it's accountable both ways. Now, if you don't trust the telecom and you don't trust the venue, you can also trust the Taipei municipality. There is an app called Taipei Pass. If you install Taipei Pass and scan the QR code with Taipei Tong with Taipei Pass, then the private info goes to the Taipei city and not to telecom or the venue. So by uh, decentralizing in a polycentered way, the storage, we ensure that no single party have the complete picture and indeed cannot piece together your movement history without uh, a authorized call from the contact tracer, the professional contact tracer. And the judicial system uh, keeps us in check as well as the public hearings uh, called by the legislative. So as long as the other two branches in the government are functioning properly, uh, I don't fear a regime change because uh, this multi-party design ensure people do not misplace their trust and store their data to someone that they do not already trust more than the other parties. Now the legislative, uh, of course, uh, are now looking at the uh, center, uh, the Communicable Disease Act, the CDA, and maybe um, after the new normal become like inescapably new normal, uh, we will uh, find the legislative time to uh, put the entire one and two SMS and everything into the CDA, making sure that there is a legislative oversight written in the law. But at the moment, the judicial oversight is working pretty well. There was a judge uh, that uh, act as a whistleblower and posted uh, on the public media saying uh, there is a police 
that through a wiretapping law, um, you know, look at the SMS as people, some people did, I think also in Korea and Singapore, but instead of discarding that information, the police actually went to those stores uh, and to piece together the movement of this um, uh, suspected criminal. Now, this is obviously outside the intended use of the SMS code. So, as soon as I learned about this. We uh, convened in the CECC uh, and the Ministry of Justice simply ruled, the ruling is public now, that uh, this is not communication because when you're checking in, there's no other person to communicate with you. This is just data storage. Data storage is not communication and therefore should not be wiretapped. Uh, and so by essentially limiting the administrative power, uh, we are now at a pretty good place of balance where if there's anything called uh, as out of norm by the legislative or the judicial within a week or so, we'll just simply uh, issue an interpretation and say, no, it's not the intended use, let's not do that. And then eventually all these will hopefully be written into the uh, Communicable Disease Act, just as how the CDA was revised substantially after SARS in 2003. This time we'll also update it uh, for SARS 2.0 so that even with the regime change, people are not um, coerced into storing private data in any place that they are not already comfortable with and that already existed before the pandemic. All right, uh, so let's go back to this seven people um, and Kotaro Tanaka-san would like to know, how would you involve people who are not tech savvy into open innovation? Well, by simply going to them uh, and asking what would they do in my place. So, uh, I think some of you know that I call my grandma every other week and visit her every other week. So, like weekly, every Sunday. Uh, and uh, she's almost 90 years old now. Uh, and she has a lot to say uh, to all the innovations that, that we're, we're making. Uh, for example, uh, back last year when we're doing mass rationing, uh, I had this wonderful idea or so I thought uh, that instead of queuing in the pharmacies uh, to buy some masks, uh, I would rather the elderly use their um, was the debit card in the ATM uh, in a convenience store. So just insert the debit card and wire um, like 52 NT dollars uh, into the CDC account. And with this print out, they can collect the pre-registered mask at the counter of the convenience store. I thought it's a great idea. Uh, however, uh, we always run focus group tests. And my grandma, uh, because she didn't queue for the mask herself, uh, she had a lot stockpiled before the pandemic, but she knows someone uh, who uh, actually goes to a pharmacy uh, every week and complain loudly about it, her younger friend, Grandma Yang. Uh, and uh, her younger friend, because Grandma Young is 77 years old, not exactly young from my uh, point of view, but certainly young from my grandma's point of view. So her younger friend walked with me and walked together to the family court and try out this entire uh, way of pre-ordering mask. And she said, um, there's no chance to use that. And I'm like, why? This is obviously more convenient. And she's like, well, do you see the um, the anti-fraud 165 stickers on the ATM? If I type my password wrong, then I will wire my entire saving out and I would not have the way to uh, recover from that. Or what if the people queuing after me uh, uh, memorize my password uh, and uh, you know uh, defraud me and things like that? So, so she's very afraid of operating the ATM. ATM is uh, a place associated with scam. So uh, she's like, if you force me to use the ATM, I will just go back to the pharmacy and queue and complain about the government. And I'm like, okay. So we changed it completely so that she can enact exactly the same process as they, she would uh, in the pharmacy. That is to say, go to a convenience store, use their health card, not the debit card, no password required, take the printout. But because the uh, health, card, health card has no way to pay, so she would go to the counter and count 52 in coins 
uh, to pay for the counter, and she feels very safe because then there's no way that anyone can scam her out of any money. She counted that in her pocket, right? So uh, of course she can still choose to use electronic payment, but she trusts the coin. So we should not force her to use electronic payment. That was the lesson. So the point here is that if you make it swifter, uh, faster for a majority of people. But a minority of people, senior people, people with different abilities, feels less safe. Then, if you force them to use this new design and obsoleting the old design, then they will be very vocal, and their vocal uh, backlash will make everybody else also trust less about the system. And so, the digital innovation would not work. Rather, we need to, before rolling it out, just listen to all the sides, taking in all the sides, and make sure that all their feedback are promptly acted upon. So I, I thank Grandma Young uh, profusely. Uh, I think she made the news uh, with a picture of me filming her <laughs> operating the kiosk machine. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, we got her uh, on board and she helped convincing her younger friends, uh, 66 years old perhaps, uh, to adopt this new uh, kiosk based, but not debit card based uh, mask pre-ordering system. So just, just go to the senior people, ask them to participate, and they actually have a lot of wisdom and can help you to convince uh, many of their friends and neighbors. They are key opinion leaders usually in their communities. All right, so uh, the next one, uh, also from Professor Guo, um, would you like to, to expand on, on that, the, the men maintaining this policy? Yes, um, you know, um, I record the uh, sunflower movement, which was triggered by the hasty process of trying to pass it to the mm -hmm. uh, legislative uh, yuan. So there, definitely there was something not transparent at all. Mm -hmm. So you um, amazingly and put this uh, your policy as a radical transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but because of the current uh, uh, party, which is DPP, uh, DPP mm -hmm. right? So I wonder whether you have done something to make sure this uh, legacy will continue. Of course, mm -hmm. they're still there, but uh, this uh, transparency will be embedded in the politics of the mm -hmm. US government. Yes, this is an excellent political question. Now, um, in Taiwan, we pride ourselves as valuing human rights, right? And we have uh, imbued in our uh, domestic legislative, uh, the universal accord, the universal treaty, uh, even though we're not yet a UN member, uh, but we did make a locally binding domestic law to reflect on the key uh, human rights related accords and treaties uh, in the UN system. Now, the regime that did that uh, was the Mainjo regime, right? It was not the DPP regime uh, that legislated this, but because uh, this has wide um, support, so either DPP or nowadays the, the uh, Taiwan People's Party or the New Power Party and so on, uh, they need to compete on being even more conscious of human rights than the other parties, rather than going backward, because going backward is unimaginable. It's a international treaty and Taiwan, even though it's not a uh, party to the treaty, we have already legislated it. If any presidential candidate say, oh, my platform is just to repeal the human right accord, I'm sure that they will stand no chance of getting elected as the president. So uh, we are already at that point. Now, uh, the same could be said for uh, the CEDAW, right? The elimination of this discrimination against women uh, in all the different regards. Again, the gender mainstreaming, which may some people say, oh, it was uh, promoted by Annette Liu, uh, which may be the case indeed uh, in her vice presidentship. Uh, but again, uh, President Ma or President Tsai only continued uh, on the gender mainstreaming. They could not go back uh, on gender mainstreaming. Again, that's another uh, very similar take. So for radical transparency, for participation and accountability, Taiwan has already published 
not just in the uh, administration, but also in the legislative, the open government national action plan. So if you search for uh, OGNAP or open government national action plan, you will find not just one, but two national action plans, one from the administration and one from the legislation. And especially the open parliament part, it was uh, done with the consultation and co-creation with the civil society and with all the four different parties, four major parties uh, in the legislature. And I believe led uh, by a nonpartisan uh, member of the parliament, Freddie Lim. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we can uh, very safely say for this term, obviously, we'll make more contributions to radical transparency, but whomever winning the next legislative uh, election, which party, must because that they double down on the open government national action plan and not, you know, going back and eat their words, as we say here, it, it's not possible. So I'm very optimistic about not just maintaining, but furthering this policy. And I look forward, actually, the head of the parliament, uh, Yossi Quinn, I believe, uh, did say that uh, he welcomes a healthy rotation as long as the next ruling party doubles down on those core uh, principles. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. telling us about this because now all our students are more optimistic mm -hmm. than what we heard several days mm -hmm. ago. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'm very optimistic myself because I work with the cabinet uh, starting end of 2014 uh, at a time when uh, Mao Zhigou was the premier and Zhang Shenzhen was the vice premier. Uh, and they're also remarkably nonpartisan in the open data and open government work uh, that they do. Uh, well, I believe Simon Zhang uh, didn't really join the KMT until his vice president bid, but maybe he's still nonpartisan now, right? So uh, I, I believe this is a unique thing in the Taiwanese system in that in the cabinet, people like me, the uh, horizontal ministers, and even the ministers of uh, ministries, most of us are nonpartisan. Uh, I think there's more nonpartisan members of the cabinet than members of any party. So uh, the independent is uh, actually the, the largest party uh, in the cabinet and certainly on the ministry at large level, I think only two ministers at large out of nine belongs to political parties. Uh, and so that means that we are in a remarkably continuous uh, fashion when we want to uh, push such democratic innovations and international uh, alliances because the open uh, government partnership is an international organization, right? So all these uh, are continuous. For example, our current ministry at large for foreign trade, uh, trade negotiation, Deng Zhenzhong, uh, was the Minister of Economic Affairs in the Ma Yingzhou cabinet. So at this level, this is a re remarkably uh, lower level of partisanship as compared to either our legislative uh, Yuan or other parliaments in other countries. Yeah. Great to know that. Thank you. So the next one, yeah. Please. Oh, again, I'm sorry. Who voted? No, it's fine. It's fine. You're you're popular. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do so you this one uh, is about future leaders, right? What kind of qualities are most important uh, for being a leader like me? Um, I, I think of leadership uh, as ensuring that there is a space for innovation that is swift and safe. And that means that um, just like when I visited Germany for a year, when I was 11 years old, um, my, my mom used to drive and take us places and uh, the high freeway system uh, in Germany is called the Autobahn. And the de defining characteristic is that the safer you are, uh, it means that you need to drive faster. And the faster you drive, uh, ensure you're actually safer. Uh, and this sounds quite paradoxical to an 11 year old, but uh, my mom explained that the cars were built for this, the signs were built for this, a uh, very uh, strict training uh, to obtain driver license uh, can contribute to this. But when you have all the rules and norms and uh, habits of drivers aligned in such a way that maximizes uh, people's alignment 
then uh, this hardware, this infrastructure almost magically ensures that there's no speed limit and you're still safer, uh, even without the, the speed limit. Uh, and I believe for leaders, it is uh, paramount that we can foster a swift innovation. But instead of saying moving fast and break things, well, Zuckerberg used to say that, but he doesn't say that anymore, right? <laughs> Instead of moving fast and break things, we need to move fast and repair things and fix things and make things safe. Uh, so that the safety is a result of a fast cycle of iterative uh, function. It's not uh, just because we delay ourselves or we pass the health inspections, safety inspections and things like that. We need to build in within our innovation cycle a real-time feedback so that people like Rema Young or like the pharmacist or people like that, they understand if they point out a flaw in the system, a bias in the data and so on, uh, and suggest a better way to do it. Well, within the next week, we will change very quickly and do simply that. And once you build in such a swift feedback system, you will actually roll out things that are less risky for everyone involved. And maintaining this uh, will make the alignment uh, issue, like making sure people all want this or at least can live with this, much easier. And once that is reached, then people maybe don't call you a leader anymore. People will think uh, what is a Taoist thing, right? Uh, naturally, it is the way to do things. And I believe that is one of the pinnacle of leadership because you can then dedicate your uh, time in a much more creative ways instead of babysitting people. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, five people would like to know, why did I decide to work in the government? Um, well, it's fun. I'm working in the government for fun uh, and I kind of invited myself in right by occupying the parliament uh, in 2014. Uh, so, like, strictly speaking, pedantically speaking, that's working in the parliament, but uh, it's occupied. So, um, the, the point here I want to make is that uh, it's not that the government is my only um, identification, I often say I work with the government, certainly not for the government. Uh, so in the government, uh, my position is that of a Lagrange point, the, the point between, say, the moon and the earth, where there's equal gravitational pull, so uh, you don't end up orbiting the movements on one side, on the society, uh, but neither the government on the other side, but rather the communication satellite usually are at that place, because uh, it can relay the messages uh, with highest fidelity without uh, being captured into any particular worldview uh, in that gravitational field. So I use that uh, metaphor to say that I'm working with the government, but I'm also working with the people, not for the people. I'm also working with the international um, open innovation, open source community. I'm indeed uh, taking seven different part-time jobs uh, in international NGOs and social innovation organizations while being the digital uh, minister in Taiwan. So that means that my main contribution is not any top-down innovation from, from myself, but rather I'm connecting innovations from abroad to Taiwan. For example, the quadratic voting uh, did not originate in Taiwan, it originated in Ethereum. Ethereum is like this virtual country where they are trying out new democratic and governance technologies. And once they figure something out, uh, we can, because I'm part of radical exchange movement, uh, take that and then talk to the president saying, hey, let's use this new uh, voting method that was just invented uh, in Ethereum, which we now also use for the president presidential culture award uh, and things like that. So uh, I believe this is uh, a really um, open way to think about my work because then if it works in Taiwan, that's great. It works as a lab, as an example. If it doesn't work in Taiwan, then we don't hide it. We publish what didn't work in Taiwan and what did, uh, like in open access preprint uh, journals. Uh, and then people who stumble upon those uh, papers and processes just do their own innovation without having to sign any uh, treaty or to sign any MOUs uh, with Taiwan. So that's my preferred way of working. So let's move on then. Um, five people would like to know, have you faced any difficulties 
in implementing your ideas, not my idea, the community's ideas, while working uh, with other government officials during the pandemic period, and how do you resolve them? This is a, a great question. <clears throat> now, um, one of the most important uh, characteristics of open innovation is it's everyone's business with everyone's help. And with everyone's help necessarily means that different people assign different priorities depending on their position. So obviously, for example, the Ministry of Economy will prioritize some things, whereas the uh, Agency for Environmental Protection will prioritize something else. This is their, their nature. Uh, and for example, uh, during the pandemic, um, I, I talked about the, the pharmacy, the queuing to buy masks in the pharmacies. Now, the Pharmacists Association and the Food and Drug Administration within the Ministry of Health and Welfare um, innovated so that when you're queuing, uh, they will hand you those numbers, uh, take a number system. So you just store your health card in the pharmacy uh, in the morning. And in the afternoon, after they process the health card during the lunchtime, lunch break, uh, you go back to the pharmacy and collect the mask. Now, that is innovation, and it's uh, genuinely uh, improving the uh, work quality of the pharmacies because then they still have some time to actually do their original business of drug dispensing. Now, uh, some other innovators from Dev Zero said, no, we, we should visualize the remaining mask uh, on each pharmacy in the real-time map. So once uh, people use their phone or a chatbot, they can just go to the place where uh, it still have some in stock. Now, this also provably save time even before they get endorsed on the national level. But these two innovations together and each have their internal champions uh, in the government uh, clashed like um, Coca-Cola with Mentos, right? They, they literally exploded because if you uh, hand out numbers in exchange for the health cards during the morning and process them during the lunchtime, then from the mask maps point of view, this pharmacy did not sell any mask until noon. So uh, the entire morning, people will look at the map and just go and visit the pharmacy thinking it still have plenty in stock. And the pharmacists have to keep explaining, no, we're already running out. It's just not reflected on the map. Uh, so much so that there's a nearby pharmacy near my residence with a very large banner of A4 printed paper that said, don't trust the app exclamation mark so the <laughs> exclamation mark is its own a4 paper so really shouting uh and so instead of uh you know getting discouraged my way of resolving it is always the same i just walk into the pharmacy apologized i think i bought something uh <laughs> Jensen or something, but anyway, and just something to, to drink, just to, to, you know, make sure that I come across as friendly. And then the, the pharmacist say, yeah, this, this, this sucks, uh, he said, but let me figure out how to improve it because you asked so nicely, right? I literally ask if you are the digital minister, what would you do? Because I don't know how to resolve this. And then the next time I visit just after a day, what what this uh, A4 paper is gone, and and he's like, oh, we figure out something. Uh, look, you didn't check the uh, sign of the number, so we can always, by the time that we hand out the last number card, we can just say, oh, we received negative one thousand piece of mask from the CDC, and in the system, it will create a negative inventory, and the map doesn't know how to handle negative inventory, so they will just uh, disappear from the map. Problem solved, and and they're like, well, it's a hack, I know, but don't let the minister Chen, our commander, know about it because otherwise our life will become difficult again. Well, anyway, so after listening to them and understanding this hack of the system, I went back to the National Health Insurance Administration and say, let's just make a button so that anytime when anyone runs out of the cards to send, they just click that button and disappear from the map. No hacking required. And they implement that uh, in a, a week or so. So uh, I go into this detail because there's literally no way for me to figure out a solution because I'm not a pharmacist. I, I am not working in the front line. 
if we don't empower the people closest to the pain, there's literally no way to get them out of the pain because we cannot really describe in this detail. And by simply visiting, apologizing, mm -hmm. buying some health drinks, uh, and then saying, yeah, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, let me know what to do. Uh, well, it engaged the entire community. They actually have an association called 年轻药师协会 or something, uh, the Association for Young, uh, young Pharmacists. And they just bring storm, I, I guess, the entire night and figure out something that actually works. So engage the collective intelligence. Don't presume instead of just ask and then amplify the better ideas. Great. Awesome. So uh, let's move on then. So um, four people would like to know uh, Yuki Matsuura's uh, question. Uh, nationwide vaccination program is ongoing both in Taiwan and in Japan, yes. How can technology help speed up the process? And do you have any idea? In Taiwan, we're facing a particularly interesting configuration where when I got my first job, AstraZeneca, in uh, April 21st, nobody in my family wanted to get vaccinated. So uh, I, I had to actually ask uh, my executive secretary saying, hey, we're, we're going abroad later this year. Shouldn't you get vaccinated? I just got vaccinated. And he's like, yeah, maybe later. So, so at that time, uh, we, we have some AstraZeneca shots, but we had to say anyone who wants to get a shot can get a shot. And we arrange some travel clinics and so on. And we need to really um, convince people because otherwise nobody wants to uh, get a jab and so they could re expire actually at, at the time in, in April. Now, of course, it's a world of difference, right? From the uh, May and June's uh, vantage point, it's almost unbelievable that back in April, uh, anyone in Taiwan would say, oh, maybe later, but, but that was, was the fact. Uh, and the same uh, association actually sometimes persisted. So by May, even though people really want to get vaccinated, some people say, yeah, I refused, like, uh, like retro ration, rationalization. I refused in April because that was AstraZeneca. If this is BNT or Moderna, I would like to get vaccinated, but not at all AstraZeneca. A lot of people were saying that back in May. So unlike many other jurisdictions where people have no choice uh, in getting the uh, particular brand or type of vaccines, at the moment in Taiwan, anyone can choose multiple choice. Of course, you can check all of it, can choose whether you prefer uh, the local Medigen uh, or BNT or AstraZeneca um, or Moderna or uh, some other maybe, um, uh, Novavax or something uh, that Taiwan receives from COVAX. So the, the point here is that because there's widely different uh, willingness to vaccine, if we simply say, okay, if we receive a batch of vaccine, we open up a, a vaccination spot, we do not know how many people will show up. If it's AstraZeneca, sometimes uh, back in um, late May, early June, uh, there's some municipality that set up everything and then I think less than one half of the expected people show up. On the other hand, if they uh, set up to uh, offer something that's very popular, like the Moderna vaccine, well, sometimes people in nearby counties all come and visit, uh, and uh, they could not serve all the people, and that also lead uh, to, to complaints. So um, there, there really is no way out, and I, I believe there is some uh, people that said, oh, you, you should just offer them a lottery or, or things like that. I believe some uh, region in Japan actually did try that. Uh, in Taiwan, people do not like queuing uh, outdoors. So any lottery that involves queuing outdoors is a, is a non-starter. So it's within this uh, constraint uh, we devised a system where people very simply just register their willingness and then we just invite exactly the same amount of people from that type of vaccine according to how many vaccines we receive that particular week. And that solves all the problems of logistics because, well, for AstraZeneca, very quickly, people 38 years old, 27 years old, and now 18 years old can receive AstraZeneca, but because Moderna is very popular and we didn't quite receive enough. Uh, so we're still at, I think, around 65 years old or uh, 
50 years old with uh, different health conditions for Moderna. And in medicine, well, you can just walk in and <laughs> get medicine anytime you want and so on. And BNT is for the uh, young people uh, and people who are above 65 years old, because for the younger people, BNT is the only vaccine that they can use and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that we devise in instead of a single unified platform for all types, we have a different schedule for each different type and together uh, ensure that as soon as we receive something a week, we can actually vaccinate that to people who will not uh, give up on us, right? Who will not uh, do a no-show. People will show up and indeed uh, people did. So that's how we very quickly get to the uh, vaccine coverage that we have now. And we're currently only bounded uh, by the influx of incoming vaccines, but it looks like the BNT is now being a more steady supply at this particular moment. So this willingness matching system, uh, I believe play a large part in getting people feel less anxious about when exactly would they get a vaccine? And that's uh, if you're interested in the design and so on, uh, you can check out digitalministry.tw. That's my website. And there's a couple of blogs that talks into more details of the design of the system. All right. Yeah. So um, now we're at a uh, one hour mark, right? So is there anyone who want to raise a hand and ask a question via voice? If not, uh, I propose that maybe we take a five minute break uh, and and afterwards uh, we'll be back and we'll still resume in Slido. But if you have anything you'd like to raise a hand, uh, that five minutes is a great um, opportunity for you to think about so what, 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 what to ask. Is that okay with you? Sure, that'd be great. Um, actually, let's take a 10 minute break. Okay. 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 Thank you very Absolutely. much. And so students, let's come back to- uh, 10 past three. Yes, here, mm -hmm. 10 past the four. Okay. okay, awesome. Yes, All right. see you later. See you again. Thank you.
Thank you for coming back. And yeah, we're uh, back. Yes, please. Um, let's continue. Is it okay? Yeah, anyone want to raise a hand or any questions yeah. before we dive to Slido? Uh, can I ask to raise a question? Of course. Uh, thank you. So I was really moved by your statement about the need to empower the people to fix bugs in the system or society. And I think the empowerment of the people is the concept that is lacking in Japanese people in that um, many Japanese people rely on the government to fix everything for them and that is maybe justified by the election system. So my question is, if the government doesn't provide you the platform to empower you, then who else can provide the opportunity for the people to be equally empowered? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let, let me clarify the question a little bit. Do you mean that uh, the government sees the need, but currently do not provide such a platform for new ideas to be understood by the society? And you're asking how to essentially be a, a shadow government, right? Do what a government should do in the first place. Is that a question? Um, yes, that's partly true. And I think that Japanese government tried to um, involve the people uh, who they need uh, within the government. So they don't really em try to empower their government. They just try to mm -hmm. trust. Uh, I, see, I see, I see. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so um, I, I believe for things that are obviously the government's job, <clears throat> I'm thinking about ensuring there's electricity, there's communication, there's basic education, <clears throat> there's um, health coverage. Uh, these are kind of natural things that people would expect a government to provide. Uh, and if you start to provide similar things by yourself in the civil society, you will gain legitimacy just as the government would do. Basically, anywhere that the government isn't doing well, I'm thinking in Taiwan, we had a really large earthquake, uh, the September 21st earthquake. Now, 
The earthquake, of course, necessitates a lot of rebuild process to build back better. But at the time, most of the uh, actual local need is supplied by uh, either the um, the Buddhist, uh, usually Ciji, but also other Buddhist practicing uh, charities uh, or uh, churches uh, that are active, especially in indigenous areas of the uh, Protestant uh, um, ideas and so on. So, so these are religions, right? They're, these are network organizers based on specific set of values, and they're certainly not governments. But because their participation in the uh, post-earthquake uh, building back Bata, first of all, is that this idea of social sector start to solidify in Taiwan. Previously, those uh, adherents of different religions don't talk to each other that much, but because they need to work on such a large disaster recovery project, they have to work very closely together uh, on the working level. And second, still to this day, if we have a large earthquake in eastern Taiwan, which we often do, uh, if the local government publish a number uh, of affected people and Ciji publish the number from their uh, Buddhist uh, system, uh, people usually trust the second number. They don't trust the first number as much as they do to Ciji. And uh, even uh, this round uh, for the counter pandemic, one third of the BNT that came from Germany uh, were purchased by the Ciji charity. So uh, they're already government-like in, in legitimacy. So uh, I get to this detail because we really need to, um, to, to look at such opportunities where governments are at a legitimacy crisis. And if they do not feel that uh, role, then of course people would nevertheless do do anything, everything to to get uh, the situation better. But if you step in then as a organizer, as a social innovator, and say, okay, let's make it a a permanent structure. Let's prepare ourselves. It's like the oldest idea of a credit union, right, formed by the local people. Uh, then that uh, meta stable. Um, uh, organization or, or that a social innovation will take root into the local culture. And then before long, you will be able to uh, participate in the municipality because the municipality cannot ignore you. And then you will have a real chance becoming part of the political expectation that other cities people say, hey, I, I want this too, right? Well, uh, this uh, model obviously works. And sometimes for the more technical or digital like swift and safe innovations. Uh, this is almost immediate. Uh, like I, I think of the June uh, vaccination in Taiwan uh, and a lot of city because it's elderly people, they all use the so-called Umi method uh, from Yumei Ding is a, a place in Japan. And we all look at a television reporting uh, where the elders don't move at all. And it's in this kind of moving chair uh, that the doctor and the nurse uh, follow to each elderly people uh, and uh, vaccinate them in, in very quick succession. So if it's one simple innovations like that, chances are it will even get international uh, welcome and then become kind of uh, just people would expect the normal thing to do. It will become the new normal. And then after that, the government really cannot ignore you. They must join you. So a lot of innovations in GovZero started by career public service, usually middle level, section chief level, going into the GovZero proposing something that works better than their status quo, but pseudonymously, not with their original name. And once the G0V solution gets uh, domestic uh, media coverage, then they will get assigned <laughs> to do whatever that the civil society is already doing. Uh, but actually, it's probably proposed by the same person. So, so basically, if you can get some connection to section chief level, in the public service. Uh, you can also ask them, what, what are your uh, innovations that you never get the political will and budget uh, to realize? Let, let me uh, help you to try it out from the academia or from the local community. And before long, if it gets domestic or international coverage, that will become their KPI for the next year. And then you've successfully hacked the system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions that people would like to raise before uh, we go into slider? Yes, yes, Sugata-san, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, thank you so much for your talk. And yeah, I was so impressed of your um all words. And um I saw your interview and you said that um you realized the importance of diversity of different opinions through your educational experiences. And my question is, you know, how can um digital technology or AI help mm -hmm. us you know feel closer feel truly closer um to people from different backgrounds or you know totally different opinions and help us more open-minded to the different perspectives so mm -hmm. maybe i believe you know face-to-face -face communication at school or you know many educational environments of life um, is very important but um, I'm very interested in how AI can contribute to that um, realization of the importance of edu um, importance of diversity. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I do believe co-presence, that is to say, uh, getting the experience together uh, in the same virtual or real place is is really the only way uh, to build empathy, to put, put ourselves in other people's shoes, which is why I have to, you know, go to the pharmacy. I have to uh, go in line uh, in the uh, kiosk or in the convenience store with the grandma young uh, and so on, because without such first-hand experience, they can, of course, write up whatever they want to petition, but I would not be able to understand what that is uh, that they are petitioning. So there, there really is no alternative to experience things together. <clears throat> now, the 5G network and soon beyond 5G uh, liberates us from the offices. Uh, I'm looking at like probably all of you are in a room of some sort. Uh, of course, it looks beautiful with trees outside and so on, but, but still we're, we're confined uh, in a room uh, because, well, for this generation of high speed video conferencing, uh, people are in the habit of relying on fiber optic connection on Wi-Fi and things like that. But truth to be told, uh, in many places in Taiwan, 5G works as good at, in a low latency mode uh, as fiber optic. Uh, I had, uh, um, you know, people who, who kind of piggyback on me uh, as I drive uh, from Taipei to Yilan uh, or to some other place. Uh, and I have this uh, real-time conversation with them and there's almost no latency. And once we're freed from the rooms that we are in, we can actually get a glimpse, especially uh, if we have 360 cameras and so on. Uh, to get into the kind of first person feeling of the uh, people in that particular place. And sometimes there is really uh, no other viable alternative because if it's uh, deep sea diving or if it's climbing on very high mountains and so on, uh, the, the cost is prohibitive for any particular ordinary citizen to join, but it is very easy uh, compared to you know actually going there uh, to get the full virtual reality gear is actually uh, much cheaper uh, than the actual uh, visit. So uh, for issues like that, where local domain knowledge is needed, sometime before we hold a collaboration meeting, uh, we will just have five minutes, 10 minutes of a experience session. It may take place through uh, kind of uh, immersive projections, or we actually hand VR glasses uh, to the participants and so on. Uh, for example, when we uh, want to talk about climate change, uh, I was in Paris, uh, I think 2015, 16-ish. Uh, 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 and then uh, we actually used uh, the Gear VR, which was uh, first rolled out to look at the atmosphere uh, from the International Space Station. And then uh, all the you know, jurisdictional boundaries are gone and you can actually see and feel the Earth as a whole, uh, obtaining this observer overview effect. And then this didn't really take long. I think it's just three minutes, five minutes of uh, kind of impressing the Earth on our uh, minds. Uh, and then we start 
having a conversation, but we became much better people, right? We think of global issues, um, having the earth as a object in our mind, uh, instead of as something abstract. So I bring this up because I, I do believe that co-presence is what shared reality, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality techniques are pointing us at. If we're trapped in our solo virtual realities, then it is actually a net negative to the kind of empathy building and pro-social communication. It probably will hurt democracy if we're all in our own realities. But if we commit ourselves, as I do, to only visit shared realities, then that helps to build empathy more than the two-dimensional conversations uh, we're having now. So uh, I think the technology is the same, but whether to use it as a solo virtual thing or as a co-presence shared thing, that's up to each designer and each policymaker. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a really good question. <laughs> Other questions? So if not, uh, I will just open Slido again. All right. Yes, please. All right, four people would like to know, um, should quote digital literacy unquote be man mandated for internet users, just like drivers needing to acquire driver's license so that you don't hurt people, right? That, if that, that's the basic idea. Um, so, um, uh, yes and no. Uh, I do think that there need to be digital literacy uh, in basic education and lifelong education, of course. But, but I don't think that's, that's enough, though. Um, I, I believe in competence, not uh, particularly literacy. I believe literacy is just a stage toward competence. Literacy is the ability to comprehend and to uh, appreciate and make criticisms and things like that. But competence is the ability to produce, to co-produce, to make, basically, uh, a maker's education. Because uh, the internet is not just a fixed thing. When people think about using the internet, they're actually using particular applications, particular protocols on the internet. But internet is vast. There is always new protocols to be discovered, right? There was the, the uh, Napster protocol that led to the BitTorrent protocol that led to, in some way, to the Bitcoin protocol that led to the Ethereum protocol and so on. And, and it's not something that people who only learned about literacy in the 90s could actually uh, be comfortable uh, joining. So the only way to be comfortable when so much new emergent protocol applications are being invented is just to be a co-inventor, to, to make data yourself, to contribute to the global climate sensing yourself, to contribute to fact-checking yourself, to contribute to all those meaning-making activities. And only then can you say, oh, I'm using the internet for this particular purpose. But internet is not the uh, end in itself. I'm not just using the internet. So, see the difference? Uh, I may say I engage in activism. I have experience in activism for human rights. But I don't say I'm a professional activist. This actually means nothing, right? <laughs> if you say I'm a professional activist, and the, a fair question is say for what? Uh, and so the same thing is need to be asked for the internet. Okay, I'm a very literate internet user. For what? What what is that that you want to connect through to the internet? So uh, I, I do believe that literacy is important. Uh, I also believe within the same uh, education curriculum, especially in basic education, as soon as somebody become literate, we need to put that somebody into a place where they can make actual contributions. It may be small, just fixing typos on Wikipedia, just mapping their neighborhood on the open street map. There's a thousand different things to do, but then they realize internet and the digital realm is there to connect people. It's not just to connect person to machine. It's not there just to connect machine to machine. It's not a tool that you just 
master the tool, rather it is a place where new ideas and values and interests are being connected together. And if that worldview, that competence worldview is part of the education, then I'm all for the literacy uh, education that's part of it. I, I read uh, in the uh, digital agency Japan's uh, announcement press conference, uh, the idea of digital competence, which is a lot of syllables, uh, is now being shortened to just digital, right? So just like Bushido uh, is a way to be kind and contribute to the society through practicing the martial art, which makes uh, someone a more, I guess, a better person, a more con con conscientious person. Uh, well, the digital is like a practice of Bushido and that helps the people leaves no one behind and contribute in making the common sense together uh, toward this digitally empowered society and so on. I think it's a, it's a beautiful take. Uh, Jim mula uh, did talk about uh, digital uh, with me in our uh, monthly uh, video conference, even before it got announced in the digital ministry. And I, I think it's uh, a good social innovation that I will also use in my future <laughs> communications. Like uh, it's not just literacy, it's the digital. You need to get into the Tao of the digital. Okay. All right, so four people would like to know, how should the government guarantee the technology they use do not violate people's privacy? For example, a national ID card, a national ID number, abstracting people, surveillance cameras. Um, there's guarantee as in mathematical guarantee, and there is guarantee as in um, surveillance, that is to say accountability by the people themselves. The first one, the mathematical kind, is a necessity. If the designer do not know the uh, mathematical property, then they can make all sorts of mistakes and that accidentally, not out of malice, just out of negligence uh, to, to infringe on people's privacy. So when we design uh, new systems, the cutting edge privacy enhancing technologies, such as uh, homomorphic encryption for the security side, differential privacy for the client side uh, of sharing the minimal data without identifying the person, uh, the secure multi-party computation uh, as what we did in the 1922 SMS where no single party hold the entire uh, privacy um, trail, uh, as well as many other new uh, mathematical constructs that are currently being explores zero knowledge proofs and many others. Uh, these are like the, the building materials that are fireproof. And if you are an architect to build a common building, you need to first understand what are the fireproof materials out there uh, so that you do not subject the citizens down the line to a fire disaster. But this is just a bare minimum. This is by far not enough because even if you know that this is safe, this is private, uh, things like that. The, the people who use this doesn't necessarily have the same level of mathematical knowledge, and they don't necessarily have the same trust as we probably have on the individual vendors and libraries and so on, all the components uh, that assemble together to uh, make such a system possible. So we usually, uh, from the citizen's perspective, build this mutual accountability mechanism such that if they are interested or curious about any particular component, it's either open source, like if people um, are afraid that the Bluetooth uh, Cocoa-like application in Taiwan, the Taiwan social distancing applications, if they're afraid that the Bluetooth signal will go somewhere else other than what's uh, prescribed by the mathematical model of exposure notification, then actually there is a community. You can go to join.g0v.tw, go to the contact tracing channel, and whether you want to inspect the iOS or the Android or the code, uh, whatever code for the Bluetooth, you can just ask real-time question there. And I think all the three leading developers <clears throat> are there. Uh, maybe not 24 seven, but certainly during business hours. And then you can engage them in a real conversation. This is opposed to just posting the source code online and say, okay, we, we've done our job. And if you don't believe the math, well, do the math, right? <laughs> that is doing the first 
part of transparency, but it's not really accountable unless there's someone giving an account. So uh, building such a real time forum where people can find the designers and architects and demand an account. That is also very important is equally important. And in addition to that, when people want to remix the system to use it for the purpose outside of its original design. For example, um, I, I believe Cocoa I is just for Bluetooth, but uh, for the Taiwan social distancing app, people want it to also be a QR code scanner uh, to the 1922 SMS. Now, that particular implementation needs architects from both sides feeling comfortable about it and doing this conversation in the open. And then uh, people can inspect what technical trade-offs are being done. They can inspect the QR code scanner part and so on. And people who do not have the technical capability can simply find any of your friends that has a GitHub account and point to that particular pull request and ask them what's going on here. And that in inspires people to try it out themselves. And if they find out something that must be wrong, well, they can tag me on Twitter or they can join the Slack channel and get the full account again from their uh, new perspective on a potential new application of the underlying this uh, technology. So it's a continuous process. We can't just say, oh, if you use it uh, as the designers originally intended, it would not harm your privacy. We need to say, if you use it in a way that's outside of the developers and designers imagination, here is the place where you can visit to make sure that we do not then compromise these new user and citizens privacy. And that active part is of course very time consuming, but I believe it is essential in building mutual trust. All right, so next question. Um, Junko Kiriya-san and four other people would like to know, after the situation regarding the COVID-19 pandemic has calmed down, what issues would you like to tackle in Taiwan as a digital minister? Well, I, I'm already uh, post-pandemic for a while now. Uh, I have not uh, worked directly on the vaccination or the 1922 SMS uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, then now the maintainer, uh, the Center for uh, Epidemic Command Center is already perfectly well-versed in making future changes uh, to those systems for contact tracing and vaccination. For the past month or so, uh, I'm working on uh, the so-called quintuple vouchers, the stimulus vouchers, uh, where everyone in Taiwan gets 5,000 NT dollars with a time limit. So you either, um, you know, spend that uh, as part of credit card or uh, QR code scanning uh, mobile payment systems. Uh, and you spend 5,000, we refund 5,000 to you. Uh, if you spend less than 5,000, we refund whatever amount you spent uh, until uh, next April. Uh, or you can uh, get some uh, uh, tender, right? Some uh, bills like paper, like uh, 5,000 and spend it however you want, but you probably cannot spend it for e-commerce. Now, uh, this time around, we're designing the system such that last year, uh, there's, I think, less than 8% of people in Taiwan choosing the digital payment system. They all chose, uh, almost everyone chose the paper-based system. And that is entirely because last year, uh, there's simply no pandemic in Taiwan. People, people do not, uh, they are not afraid of touching the, the paper bills and they are not afraid uh, in gathering in very large numbers. Of course, all still wearing masks, but they're they are all fine uh, with going to physical places. Now, now it is in Taiwan, even though for a while we're now in local single digits now, uh, two, two people or three people or something, well, they're, they're all Delta variant. So, so people are not that comfortable in, in gathering in face-to-face -face settings. And there's far more interest now in getting the digital payments out. So in a sense, we're later than Japan and pretty much all the countries in digital transformation for, for exactly one year. But the benefit is that we can then learn from uh, across the world how to design our payment systems such that it leaves no one behind such that it can include 
the the night markets, the vendors uh, on night market stands, which doesn't have any specific machines uh, for scanning QR code or for processing credit card payments. We can uh, make sure that everyone can uh, settle on a common QR code. Uh, we call it a TWQR. So even after next April, the same QR code can still be used, uh, whether you're using Google Pay or um, Apple Pay or whatever, anything that can scan a QR code can use this uh, common QR code format uh, for payment purposes. And we also need to make sure that uh, for small and medium enterprise who want to invest in this kind of cloud uh, payment processing system and post systems, uh, up to 80%, I think exactly 80% is reimbursed uh, by the uh, government's uh, funding, uh, science and technology funding. And previously they need uh, to file some papers using, uh, well, not exactly a seal, it's a PKI card, right? Uh, but nowadays we're simplifying it. So as long as they use a uh, telephone number registered to their name, uh, then a simple SMS is all it's needed to sign uh, their name virtually uh, on this kind of reimbursement uh, form and so on. So one simple policy, the quintuple voucher, resulted in on the electronic signature, on the payment system, on the QR code, uh, common wiring system across banks. Uh, it resulted in many, many system changes to, to just to support uh, this policy. But after this policy is passed us, after next April, all of its individual companies components will remain and then we will have a much uh, more digitally savvy um, agencies in all the different ministries. This time it's 10 different ministries involving in the stimulus voucher so that the next time they want to pay people or their citizens need to sign something for them, they can do it uh, with confidence and cyber security and privacy in a way that's entirely digital. So that's my current work for the past months or so. All right, so uh, four people would like to know, uh, China is sometimes said to be digital authoritarianism. Do we need some regulation to prevent the abuse of technology by digital authoritarianism? <laughs> is, that a, is that a question? Uh, maybe Yuki would like to expand a little bit because I'm not exactly sure this we. Yeah, Matsula-san, would you please say something a bit more? Yes. To by your question? Yes, so the the term we refers to something very ambiguous that I didn't try to specify the terms. But uh, for example, if the we if the, um, we can think of we as um, governments such as mm -hmm. using a great power in the technology and they have many personal information and mm -hmm. many uh, yeah this is related information. So how should government deal with these? information carefully so that they will not fall into digital authoritarianism. I see. So, so you're talking about the export side, mm -hmm. not the import side. Like yeah, not not that uh, we need to work on uh, you know uh, embargoing um, importing technology that could harm our own citizens' privacy, not Banning TikTok, right? But the other form, uh, where we're making general purpose computing material, how can we make sure it's not repurposed into something oppressive uh, in the PRC, right? The, the out outbound side. Okay, uh, this is a great question. Um, I, I do believe in general, um, AI or technology doesn't hurt people. It's people that hurts other people through technology. So, so the, the the people who abuse technology, the the authoritarian governments who abuse technology, of course, uh, is the the party with pri with primary responsibility. And there's only so much we can do uh, in a model of open innovation to uh, prevent uh, unnecessary abuse and things like that uh, to the you know authoritarian uh, people using it because as long as it's open innovation, chances are even if they don't get a license, if they know how it works, well, they can code it up themselves, right? Face recognition, for example, is a great example, even if we pass all the regulations to confine uh, face um, identification only between me and my personal equipment and only my face in the chip. This is like the well agreed uh, boundary, right? Uh, still, uh, anyone who have seen how it works, reverse engineer how it works, can actually code that and use it in concentration camps or, or something. So uh, I believe uh, journalism, that is to say, letting the world know 
that something out of the norm is currently being used. This is actually uh, the, the force that is keeping the authoritarians in check. Uh, back in the 80s, when I was a kid, um, Taiwan was a authoritarian um, place, right? Our jurisdiction had many human rights violations, but we didn't learn about it in school. We learned about it thanks to international correspondence, thanks to journalists stationed in Hong Kong. Uh, well, their press are now, of course, moving to Taipei. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that uh, we're, 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 it's the international watchdogs, uh, Amnesty International and many others, uh, that kept watch on the authoritarian misuse uh, in Taiwan in the 80s. Uh, later on, of course, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and so on uh, start to tackle the internet uh, uh, equivalent of it. But by that time, Taiwan is democratized, so we're, we're now on the democracy side. So. My, my point is that uh, just making sure <clears throat> that the entire technological community learns that there is abuse, recognize that as abuse, and realize that although we cannot prevent our work to be derived into abuse, we can choose to only work in teams that says no to such abuse. And I, I believe this is uh, exactly what is happening now, and it's probably the the only uh, reasonable expectation for the uh, next few years. It's by choice, not just on individual citizens and consumers, but on technologists. If the technologists all understand there is some ethical norm and refuse to work on innovation teams that uh, pollute or uh, uh, remove those norms, then we can always work on technologies uh, that help the people who are being oppressed uh, getting through the kind of oppression that they are now facing uh, under digital authoritarianism. I speak uh, with firsthand experience working on Freenet and other technologies when the original uh, grid firewall <laughs> was being built in the early 2000s. And it's thanks to the cryptographers who want to work on these pro-human rights tools vis-a-vis -vis the companies and engineers that work on those counter human rights tools that uh, still to this day, there is a way for the human rights workers within PRC to talk to international journalists somewhat safely. Great to know that. Thank you. <laughs> so um, any other follow-ups or we'll just go on, on slide it. All right. So this is a related question. Four people would like to know, what are your views on so-called digital authoritarianism and where are our democratic societies headed? Well, we're headed to digital democracy, obviously. So uh, digital is a great value amplifier. Whatever social norm you have, if it's coded into something that's convenient to use, then people will probably reenact those social norms because it's as I mentioned, uh, provides instant gratification. So uh, my work in Taiwan mostly is centered around providing instant gratification to pro-social input to group decision-making, that is to say digital democracy. But one can also imagine that a authoritarian regime makes it very, very easy and very um, instantly gratifying uh, to I don't know, uh, report uh, your neighbor uh, for social credit violations. That That's imaginable, right? Uh, it's uh, also, I guess, gratifying in an almost perverse sense, but it's imaginable. And so uh, the same um, principle of instant gratification applies here, but one is more pro-social, it's more liberating, and one is more antisocial and it creates distrust. Uh, between individual citizens, which is actually what's required for digital authoritarianism to, to work. Authoritarianism always work uh, on the authority getting uh, the, the final say on what's to be trusted, and it always works on decimating the trust between civil society groups such that there's no uh, civil society groups large enough to challenge the legitimacy of their authority. So in Taiwan, for example, when, when Ciji, as I mentioned, gained more legitimacy than the government, 
or like, of course, that's that's our civil society. They're our champion. Uh, or when the civil society uh, measure the air quality and proof that the environmental protection agencies uh, uh, pollution detectors didn't quite capture the nuances of PM 2.5, we're like, yeah, of course we can't beat them. We must join them, and and so on. And and that's democracy. That's basically anything that could be innovated in a civil society. The government says. Well, uh, more powers to you, but uh, in other authoritarian jurisdictions, uh, people would not wait for 200 people to start setting air boxes. If it's like a dozen people, they will get recruited or they will get silenced. Uh, indeed, for quite a while, uh, I believe the only uh, internet enabled air quality detector in Beijing uh, was one that's set up in the US embassy there. So <laughs> that does say something uh, about digital authoritarian. So, I do believe that we're now headed on um, very clearly defined directions and one progress in one axis is, is felt like a threat in the other axis. And in the short term, I believe these different models will continue to evolve almost in parallel. Uh, but our job is to make sure that digital democracy part uh, works well, is a viable model, uh, and just like uh, people in Taiwan in the 80s, just by reading about the model that worked in other international communities, in reading clubs and so on, eventually prompted the democratization and the formation of new political parties uh, in Taiwan, thanks to international support and international watch. And I believe that's exactly what will happen in many authoritarian regimes around the world if we keep digital democracy work. Right. So, any follow-ups? Uh, so, would like to say something? Um, I'm sorry, there's a, a, some noise. Uh, Takase-san, can you mute your voice, please? We can hear your conversation. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes, please. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh -huh. Great. It's fine. Would you please continue? <laughs> sorry sure. About that. Yes. So, um, all right. So let, let's tackle this one before, before we uh, take another break, maybe. Um, so, uh, four people would like to know what do you think is your biggest long term achievement as a digital minister? Uh, great question. <laughs> so, uh, I do think that the lowercase uh, minister, uh, it is a better description uh, of my work because I mostly just uh, preach, right? <laughs> I mostly just uh, think through things uh, and sometimes listen to confessions uh, and sometimes uh, make poetry or, or choral music. Uh, so, uh, and, and it, it's not, it's not uh, just a joke because I, I don't give uh, commands, right? And I don't receive commands. I'm a uh, minister at large, meaning I'm not uh, telling the public service what to do. I'm simply saying, hey, there seems to be something that works pretty well in the civil society. Would you like to try this model out? Or the other way around, hey, the government just released some APIs. Would you in the civil society want to try it out? That's essentially all I, what, what all I do, right? So my long-term achievement may not be in any particular invention because these are just co-invented by the GovTech people and the civic tech people. My main um, demonstration is just that it works even if uh, a minister do not issue any single command or receive any single, single command. That is to say a co-creative space uh, the public digital innovation space, the name of my office, a co-creative space works as well, or even for some cases, even better than a human minister that has the final say. Uh, and when people see that this space-based leadership um, actually works better in a norm uh, building way, better than any particular single minister, then I believe this will uh, make government uh, something that all sectors can try it out. That is to say, anyone who implement the same kind of alignment, consultation, and accountability process can be a government. Of course, uh, we probably don't call it sovereign, but, but we may call it uh, a governing entity uh, with overlapping jurisdiction. And this kind of co-governing toolkit, we already see, as I mentioned, in the GovZero initiative, 
who are perfectly capable of taking care of emerging issues that the government has no way to uh, to regulate or to uh, to to work to to facilitate. So once the um, communities figure out things like the counter disinformation accord with the PTT itself. The government's only role then is just to amplify this norm and get Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and whatever on board. And that changes the way people think about the government because previously the government is like the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? You have a professional team of elite editors. Uh, you proofread everything and then you publish. But I would like to uh, suggest a co-governing agile governance methodology where like Wikipedia, you first publish. And sometimes, uh, you know, doesn't really solve anything, but it's a good idea and it's worth spreading and it spreads and people in a civil society implements it better. So just like Wikipedia, you first publish a stub and then people start to edit. So the crowdfunding, crowdsourcing community already showed uh, that this kind of uh, very large amount of work can be done and funded uh, quite well. Um, orchestrated without any single person giving the command or receiving command. Indeed, Wikipedia itself is a testimony uh, for this co-creation attitude. Uh, but uh, I believe what I've demonstrated with people in the public digital innovation space is that this also works on the areas that people previously did not think anyone other than government could do the things like the mass rationing map, the vaccination prior registration, uh, the 1922 SMS checking in, and now the voucher stuff. So I would like to, to inspire, but not necessarily achieve. I hope that uh, answered this question. Thank right. you very much. Um, yes, let's have uh, again 10 minute break. Okay. All way. right, so we'll be back, uh, what, uh, three uh, after four or three after five for you? Uh, yes, uh, here will be five after five. Is That's that right. Time? Yes, okay, and, uh, of course. Five after see you four. then. Thank you. Yeah, see you later.
And we're back. <laughs> Thank you for coming for being back. And uh, um, I think we still have quite a lot of questions. Oh, that 41 question. There's no way that I can do that in 60 minutes. So uh, voting is important. So but be yes. before uh, we get to Slido, any question you would like to uh, ask uh, through speaking? May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay, so thank you for today's. Uh... Uh, I think you've muted. The GLP office need to unmute. <laughs> we cannot hear you now. Right. Yes. Okay. Hello. Can you hear yes. me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, I'd like to ask your views towards uh, social networking services. And mm -hmm. so, I like your tweets with many emoji, but. There's also concern that it may lead to the divide in the population, like and people might only have access to information that they prefer. So how we take advantage of this technology safely? So the question is, um, how do we prevent uh, this kind of tribe tribe mentality uh, oh, yes. on the social networking services is the question. Uh, yes. Okay. But I mean, tri tribe mentality is just human. So, so we can't, we, we, we can't absolutely remove it. But on the other hand, on many, what I refer to as antisocial social media systems, uh, the more antisocial messages, especially based on outrage, uh, soon turn into discrimination. Uh, and also to uh, vengeful messages like calling for revenge. And once that uh, message gains foothold, because in a sense, uh, in any platform with the number of likes, um, people will almost unconsciously uh, rate their own posts based on the number of likes that they receive uh, from the social media. And it's in invariably, um, if you post something that's very civilized, as opposed to posting something uh, based on outrage, of course, something based on outrage will get more likes uh, because people want to support you. But then uh, that means that people will soon form into a tribe, a in-group, and that will then uh, cause the future uh, normalization of behavior of, uh, as I mentioned, vengefulness as well as discrimination. Now, uh, the whole idea of humor over rumor is to find something that's even more viral than outrage. Uh, that is to say, it takes the same root of outrage, but then make fun of it. And then by making fun of it, uh, it's inviting, right? We're not making a joke at expense of particular people or person. We're making a joke because the situation is funny. Uh, and that is humor, right? It's not sarcasm. So uh, based on this, then uh, just by making fun of ourselves, basically, we invite people who are not quite like us uh, to be part of conversation and get even more likes. Uh, and this is my uh, technique of uh, so-called hugging the troll uh, online. Uh, there's a, a few posts about troll hugging. You can search for it on the internet. So, so that's my personal practice. Now, uh, for many people, of course, um, being a poetician or a comedian or something is a lot of work. Some people are, are not that willing to put in a lot of work into making fun of themselves, right? So uh, do we simply uh, not use social networks then? Uh, I believe we need to then be picky about the kind of social network that we engage in. For example, in a sense, uh, the WebEx we're uh, using now is a social network because we can invite new people uh, as guests here. Uh, if anyone wants to invite somebody, you can just start a conversation, do a screen share, right? So we can use this synchronous video platform as a social network that brings people in, but we're quite comfortable 
with the use of Slido plus WebEx because we understand the Slido questions are not posted by people looking for outreach. They're posted by people in the same room, like same virtual room, or some of you are in the same physical room. So the use of Slido as an extended SNS with the same functionality of like and everything is safe, feels safe. Uh, there's no outrage and everybody, all the questions are pretty civilized. Or if there are uncivilized questions, uh, I haven't scrolled to it yet, right? Because it doesn't get numbers of votes. So the point here is that through a simple voting and through the simple face-to-face -face, uh, co-presence setting, uh, we establish a social network that ostensibly has the same feature as Twitter, uh, like the Slido uh, one, but we use it in a way that's strictly speaking pro-social. So if people are not the kind of person like I am who make fun of myself uh, all the time uh, and uh, troll and counter troll online, uh, people can begin with your face-to-face -face relationships and focus only on those platforms like WebEx uh, that connects the people who you already know or people who already are your classmates, acquaintances together. And then once you're in the same room, virtual room, you can say, okay, let's try Slido, let's try Polis, let's try some of those SNS, but only with the people that I already somewhat trust. And then uh, that will ensure the pro socialness of the SNS while connecting it to our face to face uh, relationship. I, I don't think everyone need to use those public SNS, but I do think among uh, friendly people, SNS is a pretty good amplifier. Thank you for answering the question. Thank you. Any other follow ups or other questions from the audience? If not, I'll just share a slide again. All right. So, four people would like to know um, as a politician, as well as a technician, um, do you think? conflicts between politicians and scientists, like between Mr. Trump and Dr. Fauci, uh, may happen in Taiwan. Um, this particular case never happened in Taiwan because our vice presidents uh, were public health experts. And I use the plural form because Vice President William Lai is an expert in public health. And the previous vice president, uh, Chen Jianren, uh, literally wrote a textbook on epidemiology. So in, in that sense, uh, if the president want to talk to a public health expert, she just walks next door. <laughs> and when, when our leading scientists at a time, uh, Dr. Chen Jin, want to talk to a vice president, he just looks into the mirror. So in this configuration, uh, really there, there is no way for this kind of conflict. And um, at a time last year, our vice premier, um, the, uh, currently the mayor of Kaohsiung, Chen Ximai, uh, was also uh, a student of public health under Dr. Chen Jianren, our then vice president. Uh, and so uh, with this configuration, basically the only thing that the president need to say or do is to say that she fully trusts the Central Epidemic Command Center, which already is uh, spiritually led by the uh, vice president anyway. So there's no distance between the presidential office and the CECC. Now, uh, of course, this is a particular advantage in Taiwan, but we do see around the world, if the politicians understand the importance of uh, delegating the power and making sure that their top scientists meet the citizens uh, more times than even the president themselves, Right, uh, our commander uh, Chen Shizhong have met through 2 p.m. daily press conferences um, thousands of times. The citizens asking uh, the citizens to do all sorts of things, whereas the citizens through the journalists and through real-time commentary and calling 1922 also ask back the commander, and and he pretty much answered everything until the journalists run out of question before ending the uh, press conference of the day. And so through this uh, mutual accountability mechanism, uh, the, um, the, the distance between the uh, uh, public health expert 
and the political leader, in this case, Committee Chen Shizhong, and the public health uh, leader, for example, uh, expert professor uh, Zhang Shangchun. Uh, they're, again, literally next to each other in the CUCC press conference. Uh, if there's a journalist question that is very technical, well, the commander just turns and asks uh, the, the Professor Zhang, or if the question happens uh, to be about the vaccination reservation platform, well, uh, yours truly, that's me, <laughs> have also attended for, for quite a few times, uh, at least twice, right, in the 2 p.m. press conference as well as the 10 a.m. press conference. Uh, again, the uh, commander just delegates the technical questions to me. So, so the point is that our relationship uh, is that of a working relationship in the public eye, in the public stage. We interact in real time under live stream with all the journalists asking real time questions. And in this configuration, very few conflicts could happen because uh, I'm, I'm, if I say, I don't know, what do you think about it? I'm saying this publicly, like literally everyone can give me ideas. And when I was attending the press conference in 2 p.m., I was also watching the PTT. There is this uh, PTT discussion board uh, called NCOV2019, uh, so Novel Coronavirus 2019. And in real time, I was also having a chat with people on the PTT during the live streamed press conference. And this is only possible because it's live streamed in real time. Otherwise, people could not give me real time ideas and questions. And so I'm using the PTT in such a way exactly like how we're using Slido now. Uh, we're having a real uh, real time conversation, but on the side, people can also post without interrupting me. And again, I'm doing this in the front of the camera and with all the CECC people uh, uh, aligned, right? Like literally aligned on the same table. And then again, any conflict like uh, that may be based on different interpretation of data or whatever gets resolved very quickly on the spot uh, for that day. So any confusion only lasts for 24 hours. And and it's bound to be resolved on the next 2 p.m. press conference. So this is through radical transparency and accountability as a way to resolve conflicts as soon as it arrives. So four people um, would like to ask. I'm so impressed with your words. I'm not a politician, I'm a poetician. Uh, and uh, Rika uh, Sang also believe the power of arts. Uh, what brought me to this realization um, I'm, I take my inspiration specifically, I think, from the Icelandic uh, Pirate Party, uh, and um, there are also poeticians uh, there in Iceland. And we uh, set up our e-petition system as an adaptation uh, of Better Reykjavik, a game from Iceland, uh, and I believe built for uh, the Reykjavik capital city by the best party. The party name is actually the best party. Uh, and so it's a bunch of people that doesn't quite take themselves seriously, <laughs> but, but through the power of comedy uh, and humor and so on, nevertheless wins the popular um, trust that uh, they could receive the actual constructive ideas from the citizenry, from the civil society, without actually being themselves uh, the commander of all things. So uh, I do believe uh, a poetician, or as I mentioned, a lowercase minister, right, that, that sings uh, chorus, right? <laughs> and uh, maybe uh, hear confessions, uh, that points to a different governing model. And I learned about it thanks to the Global Occupy community uh, and the uh, Pirate Party, uh, international movements and so on, but specifically from Iceland. All right, so four people would like to know uh, from Pavel, uh, what do you think is the future role of a government in a society where digital technology allows all citizens to voice their preferences directly? As I mentioned, uh, a government will cease to be the government, and anyone who implements governance protocols will become like the Internet Engineering uh, Task Force, like the ICANN, like the Internet Society, uh, and like in the latest distributed ledger technology circles, uh, they will form governance entities uh, and even partially autonomous ones, right, with the DAOs and such. Uh, and these governing entities through protocols that resolve the tensions from overlapping jurisdictions 
uh, I would argue is a better configuration compared to the West uh, Westphalian um, metaphor where all the municipalities, all the local groups, all the uh, charities need to exclusively belong to a Westphalian sovereign. I, I would argue that for most global issues, things that doesn't know jurisdictional boundaries like carbon dioxide, like the coronavirus, uh, like computer virus for, for that matter, uh, many things um, that people could not negotiate based on Westphalian diplomats. Uh, the internet itself, actually, for internet governance, we need to tackle it with a um, poly-centered, uh, some people call it polylateral, uh, or a hybrid multi-stakeholder multilateral. I think polylateral sounds good. A polylateral way uh, where, where each side uh, uh, is no longer just a sovereign, but rather anyone who can co-govern uh, based on this uh, interdependence protocol that we have already prototyped in internet governance. So if you uh, read the UN high-level um, expert report, uh, I think the name is uh, just digital interdependence. Um, and uh, you can see this kind of co-governing model as envisioned uh, by the United Nations expert groups on the future of governance. And I've read recently that uh, the METI, I believe, in, in Japan also commissioned a study at a second version of called Agile Governance that talks more or less on exactly the same ideas. Uh, and I believe that the METI folks are also looking for international collaboration to make this idea of agile governance, not government, uh, more uh, widely seen as the new norm, especially to tackle um, global structural issues and toward large or encompassing visions such as the Society 5.0. So, Minister Tang, if I can follow yes. on that, uh, on your answer. Yes, please do. Um, I, I was wondering, so in this case, uh, do you think that this kind of system would also work for uh, local governments? I mean, for a government of, uh, for example, Taiwan or, or Japan. So, as I understood it, so it's a decentralized system where several several actors uh, kind of cooperate together in solving uh, solving certain issue. Uh, so, if what, what would be then the role of the government, for example, of Taiwan or Japan in in in, in this policy, and could that actually yeah. work for one one concrete state? Yeah, as a uh, minister at large, I'm already treating, for example, in the eSport case, I'm already treating the Ministry of uh, Economy Affairs, the Ministry of Education, uh, and the Ministry of Culture as three different governing entities. If I'm not a minister at large. Uh, I could be saying, you know, uh, the Ministry of Culture uh, takes responsibility and the other ministry need to follow their lead uh, on the eSport case and eSport is a culture. So that's the traditional way, right? The Westphalian entity, the sovereign, the president appointed the premier who appointed the council that classified eSport as this and not that. Uh, but uh, the multi-stakeholder way that we did, along with people in PTT, didn't say anything like that. We we said um, the goal that's like Alpha Go, right? The 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 game uh, is a esport, a turn-based one. So for that particular um, goal-based regulations, uh, real-time esports can also follow as a goal that's moving faster. Uh, and so uh, it's basically creating norms first before we create regulations and budgets. And the Westphalian model works only if people think first about laws and budgets, because it is the sovereign, the top level government's role to get taxation and get the legislative power on the top level and then trickle down again to the devolved uh, local municipalities. But if what, whatever we're doing is just about protocols, it's about norms and habits and not about budgets and not about laws, then whatever we do is essentially open. This configuration, as I mentioned, many configurations uh, this time uh, can be implemented, for example, uh, in South Korea, when they implemented the mask rationing map, they didn't do it as a South Korean thing. I believe some pharmacies in the city of Seoul did that kind of autonomously. 
and working with the civic technologists in Taiwan to provide the first visualization of their mosque. And then uh, quickly, of course, the municipal uh, governments took the action, but at the time, already the private sector like Navi and so on, uh, already provided the technological implementation. I believe the Japanese Cocoa uh, is, uh, was anyway, uh, also such a prototype from the private sector, from uh, people in Microsoft, if I'm not mistaken, and contribute into open source before it gets adopted uh, by the government as the national standard on contact tracing and so on. So I'm not saying that the government disappear. I'm saying that the government is with the people and with the people first. It's not for the people where the government always need to act before the people does. It's almost always the reverse where the people in different jurisdictions and overlapping governance form ad hocacy groups and already tackle the situation to some degree. And it's up to the individual um, cities, municipalities, counties, and district to adopt this without getting any budget or approval from the national government. So the national government, I guess, will simply be there to ensure that there's digital competence, uh, that there is broadband as a human right, like the infrastructural, the most basic level of things, but the application level of things, I believe, more and more will be devolved first into municipal and district level governance, and then just across sectors. All right. So any follow-up questions or new questions before we go to slide there? If not, let's share the screen. So uh, four people uh, would like to know uh, with Yusuke san how would how should a society educate or even just treat children who cannot fit in school just because they're extraordinarily talented uh, in a certain field? Well, I, I do believe that uh, learning is common in all students. And education sometimes fits the learning, sometimes doesn't, uh, but learning, the learner uh, should take the center stage. What I'm trying to say is that school is also uh, being reimagined. In Taiwan, in our new curriculum, the students do not have to stay in the same school uh, for the entire day. They can to take not just advanced uh, placement classes, but also work with the local community builders, uh, the local uh, universities or other educational facilities, museums, uh, and things like that, and curate their own education. Basically, whatever um, the freedom of choosing the courses that people enjoy on university in Taiwan, thanks to part of our new curriculum, people can do so at senior high. So we move university to senior high level. And as a result of that, also prove that uh, people who are 18 years old are perfectly capable adults. So like Japan, we uh, shaved two years off <laughs> our adult age. Uh, and by finishing senior middle high, they're, they're adults and able to make decisions uh, for themselves. And so in, and this trickles to even younger levels of education in the primary school, as well as in the middle high, there's a lot of uh, autonomous education nowadays in Taiwan, up to 10% of students can apply to be either homeschooled uh, or experimental schooled in a group or in a alternate uh, imagined school. And these are not mutually exclusive and they are entitled to all the same benefits, um, including vaccination, <laughs> as students of the same age in the basic education system. Uh, and in some counties like Yilan, the 10% quota is even not enough. So we even had to go back and change the legislation so they can borrow the quota from some nearby counties and so on, as long as the 10% uh, is held on the national level. Because if it's 50% It's no longer experimental, it's the new uh, mainstream, right? So the point here is that any student uh, need to have the choice to go to a place where the curriculum no longer bind them. And they're not alone. Anyone who want to provide such a learning facility can do so. And with the latest legislative change, even on the university level, there could be experimental universities that are not bound by the existing university degree act and so on. Maybe they can set up a university that only offers postgraduate degrees on, um, I don't know, heritage site reconstruction. 
and things like that. And, and that would also be legal according to the latest Experimental Education Act. Already, I believe, uh, in very similar spirits, uh, existing universities are looking to do experiments of their own. For example, working with um, the Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Company to offer doctorates uh, degrees uh, in very specific uh, um, fields of physics that leads directly uh, to angstrom level uh, improvements in semiconductor now that we've used up all the nanometers that we're now moving to angstroms and things like that. So uh, I believe uh, we see education just like healthcare as both a basic duty that the government need to entail with affordable cost, but also a place where innovators are welcome and new innovations, if they prove their merits, get incorporated like into new treatments into national healthcare uh, every 10 years or so, those new ideas from experimental education have a chance to prove itself and become part of the curriculum for basic education. I hope that answers the question. All right. So, uh, five people would like to know, can the adoption of digital technology in state governance lead to a transfer of power from bureaucrats to technology savvy elites? Um, if it's about the possibility, of course, there is such a possibility. Uh, it's called technocracy. Uh, but I do believe by enhancing the uh, view of digital as connecting people, not connecting machines, and making this somewhat arbitrary distinction, right? The, the technology savvy elites, um, IT, information technology, is about connecting machines more effectively. But digital, in the sense of digital, is about connecting society more effectively. And it calls for um, the uh, practitioners, not of technology in particular, but of, say, design. Uh, of ethnography, of uh, the techniques of understanding the society better and leading the society to listen to itself better. Of course, um, you can still call them technologists, but this will be saying, you know, democracy is a technology, uh, open space technology is a technology, dynamic facilitation is a technology, which is broadly speaking true. Not all technologies need to work on physical systems. Some technology work on social systems. So thinking about social technology, social innovation, and so on, then it's no longer about elites, right? It's not about people who specialize in a particular field, but about people who have a lot of common experience, just like a professional peace negotiator. You wouldn't say they're a, a specialist in peacekeeping technology, right? You would say they have a lot of peacekeeping experience in troubled uh, jurisdictions. And so I, I'm thinking about social technologies and innovators in that vein. And in that sense, the bureaucrats or the career public service are perfectly capable of getting into that mindset of serving the public and become themselves specialists in social technologies, even though we don't quite say that. We just say, oh, they received this design thinking perspective on things. So by using the words such as design, interaction design and um, you know, participation design and um, service design and so on, I believe it unites the vocabulary both on the agile, more tech, uh, elite world, Silicon Valley and so on, uh, and the world of uh, facilitators and peacekeepers, which is why uh, we specialize on the design vocabulary in my office, because this vocabulary, uh, in my own experience, is more unifying than seeing it as a zero-sum game or a transfer of power. Using design as a perspective, as long as you can provide a fresh perspective, you're in. You don't need to hand out power. You simply need to provide your own perspective and be willing to listen to the other sides. I hope that answers the question. Again, it's based on a power theory uh, by Castells uh, called communication power. And small power theory is based on network making power and not any vertical power within a single uh, structure. Uh, if I may, Minister Tang, if yeah, I may briefly course. comment uh, or follow on, yes. on your answer. Uh, the question was uh, more motivated like by, by the danger that this adoption of digital technology can pose to uh, uh, 
uh, to the state, let's say. So uh, I know that you as a programmer and uh, IT proficient person, you trust the technology and you know what's going on and how it works. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the majority of the population is still uh, at this point in time uh, still does not know much about the inner workings of the technology itself. Uh, and trusting some of the, let's say, in, in information uh, exchanges or let's say important let's say voting and this kind of thing to technology some people may may kind of get worried because they don't understand the system itself so the people who control the system who the people who design the system they may get actually they may you know uh, gain by doing this quite a huge power because the interpretation of the data would depend on how the system has been designed and how those data has been right interpreted so i wonder if there are any uh, so if uh, for example government uh, who are adopting these uh, digital technologies if they also take this into account and what kind of um, what kind of measures do they take in order to prohibit you know so that the system is kind of hacked or being taken adva uh, advanced mm -hmm. of by somebody else yeah uh, but digital is not just about going paperless. As I mentioned, I, I believe on the very first question, we are not replacing our presidential uh, ballot or our um, legislative ballot with uh, digits. Uh, we're insisting on paper-based uh, form of voting. And that's precisely because people have a need, as you mentioned, uh, to, to check that the system is working uh, as they intended. But it's, it's not that we do not introduce any technology. For example, the, the real-time filming uh, of the tallying process. Uh, there's a lot of very innovative apps. I believe in the previous presidential election, uh, President candidate um, Tsai Ing-wen and Han Guoyu uh, each has a team of app developers uh, that offers real-time tallying um, among other social media-like uh, functionalities. The, the Han Guoyu one is called the Chuan Yun Jian anyway. But anyway, the, the app uh, allows people to communicate uh, to like-minded people. It's a way to socially organize but also because we use paper-based ballot counting, it's a way for people to report uh, any anomalies in the counting process uh, along with the video uh, evidence to, to show for it. And if a counting process uh, in any particular station has many different people using their phones, using that app of uh, Yin Bude or Chuan Yun Jian uh, to witness, then it increased massively uh, the faith uh, in democracy, because although people may not trust any particular journalist or media, people do trust the trending YouTubers of their preferred political party. And when their numbers agree, then people could be reasonably sure that we have a fair presidential election. And if we do not have this paper-based counting process augmented with this digital overseeing system, then we will end up like the USA, right? So anyway, so the, the point here is that um, we're not sprinkling digital to replace paper. We're saying whenever people care about any part of democracy, but feel that they cannot be at all the counting station at all times or whatever, then there are open innovations based on digital that can reduce the risk of doing so. And also, uh, while making people safer, also reduce the time involved in doing so. But we're never saying, oh, just because I know about technology, you should trust in technology. Uh, like the 1922 SMS QR system, even though that many people now understand how the SMS works and so on. Um, some people don't trust the, the camera right, of their phone, and that's fine, which is why we printed the 15-digit code. So you can manually enter and send an SMS to 1922 to verify that it's actually doing whatever the QR code, which is not uh, able to be deciphered by human beings. Uh, you can try it yourself with a feature phone. And for people who don't trust their telecoms at all, Still, we're, we're not asking you to, to give up on pen and paper. Many people even uh, had a seal uh, that carries its own ink uh, with their uh, last name and their contact number on it. And whenever they go to a venue, they just stamp on a piece of paper uh, in that venue, uh, and that completes the checking. Again, we never said that because we use SMS, this become illegal. We said we use the SMS so that when you're doing the paper-based check-in, it's less crowded, so uh, you have a le less chance to get uh, you know, COVID-19 from nearby people doing the paper-based registration. So um, I get into this detail because I would like to cite
say that the technological savviness is never in Taiwan's counter pandemic uh, ideas. It's never a cause for transfer of power. It's always a way to empower additionally to the people who want to try out something. But as soon as they're uncomfortable with this, we're not replacing anything that existed before the pandemic with shiny new inventions. So even today, if you do not want to buy some masks which are readily available online or in the convenience store, you can still go to the pharmacy and queue in line. If Grandma Yang wants to do that, she can still do that. Uh, and that, I believe, is a, a more, much more a network making theory of power than a more zero sum, like power grabbing uh, take of power. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So people basically um, only put as much trust as what we already trust the people. Uh, so to give no trust is to get no trust is what I'm saying. But even after giving the trust, we don't expect everybody to trust back and it's entirely okay. In fact, the people who do not trust back, keep us honest. I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's any follow ups, no. Okay. So let's move on. Um, six people would like to know, can you share the efforts done in Taiwan during the pandemic? to ensure that the non-native, that's to say non-Mandarin speaking migrant populations are not left behind. So uh, we talk about a vaccination uh, registration system. So of course there's a, a English uh, version of it. And now here uh, I believe is uh, very inclusive. So if you have a national health insurance, you can use that. If you don't, have a national health insurance, you can still uh, use your passport number. If you don't even have a passport, you can use the entry exit permit number. Uh, and so just this numbering system itself is maximally inclusive already. And it says that if you don't have, uh, for example, um, your national health activated, uh, you can just get this um, ID number uh, online if you're somebody from um, Hong Kong, Macau, or the PRC um, mainland. Uh, but if you um, just happen to find yourself in Taiwan uh, without any entry or permit, you can still take your uh, passport and to a local immigration office and nevertheless get a uh, unified number. So just by saying this, it's actually a lot of work. I, I believe this is the first time that all the five different nationality, jurisdiction, and so on, uh, incoming populations can register in the same interface. Uh, and so we had to uh, continuously update our APIs and interfaces, but it's, it's completely worth it because uh, vaccination works in such a way that it protects not just that person, but everybody near them. If we systematically say immigrant workers are not to be vaccinated, then it could create pockets of vulnerability uh, that will lead to public health disasters. Um, the same goes to people who do not enjoy the national health insurance because they just return to Taiwan and even do not have a household registration. Again, if we do not uh, vaccinate them, then they will, uh, become because they have their own semi-expat community, that will become a pocket of vulnerability and so on. So there's a compelling public health uh, reason of doing so. So we do so by, of course, taking care of accessibility. If you see three columns here, it means that it's accessible with screen readers and other accessibility uh, help us. And we also make sure that the translations are readily available from the immigration office. So even if you speak no English nor Mandarin, uh, there are basic instructions that are available in, uh, I believe, most of the new southbound, uh, southbound countries, uh, the majority of which are immigration <coughs> came from uh, for migrant workers. And even if your language is not in any of this, because we use web-based technology, Google Translate probably works. Uh, but even if that doesn't work, then uh, the strings and so on, the text for like the social distancing app and so on, they're all open source. So there are professional uh, immigrant uh, worker, migrant worker helper NGOs like 140, uh, because migrant workers, when they were founded, were 140 of Taiwanese population. Uh, so 140 also commissioned uh, even more translations uh, 
for the things that are not uh, taken care of by the ministries of health care and labor and interior. So it's a leveled thing where we take care of the two main languages and each uh, ministry take care of even more languages that concerns their primary constituent, but the entire thing is open web, HTML, and open uh, innovation data so that anyone uh, who want to translate into an even more minor language would not get sued uh, for copyright violation and things like that. So it's a layered approach, and I'm pretty happy that we've prototyped this because it become a new norm. And upon this, the uh, 5,000 voucher, those new systems they will get the same citizens uh, expectation to be maximally inclusive on day one instead of uh, in an ad hoc fashion. So I believe that answers part of the question, but we were not always like that. Uh, five years ago, we were not like that. We uh, only did the Mac compatibility uh, for text filing because a popular petition said it's explosively hostile for Mac users. So we've come a, a long way since five years ago. So, uh, four people would like to know, uh, were you confident that Taiwan could prevent COVID-19 at the very beginning of pandemic, say January and February 2020? No, I was not confident at all. <laughs> I, I remember SARS. Uh, I, I think people in Taiwan, anyone who's above 30 years old remember SARS. And SARS was pretty bad. And, and Taiwan did probably the worst. Uh, among all the SARS affected countries uh, back in 2003. And that's why we had a lot of stockpiles of masks. And that's why we have a, a Communicable Disease Act that prescribed the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center. And that's why we have a digital national health insurance card, because at the time of SARS, uh, the Taiwan island did, did only have paper based health insurance cards. Only the island of Penghu, the Pescadores Island, have those newfangled IC cards, and people see what a world of difference it makes to have a IC-based health card in the time of the pandemic. So uh, I would say I'm not confident at all, but I'm, I was cautiously optimistic that if we play the SARS playbook and this SARS 2.0 is somewhat similar to SARS, then I'm cautiously optimistic that it will work. But of course, we did at the time had no idea how similar to SARS it would be. Turns out still pretty similar. But by this year, of course, all the beta, gamma, iota, eta uh, variants were, were less and less, uh, moving less and less to uh, familiar territory. We're now in a territory where we have to invent new things, uh, not the SARS era um, guidance, but like entirely new guidelines, like the SMS-based contact tracing, which last year, if you ask me, I would say it's it's not that much needed. But this year is obviously needed because it makes a world of difference to find the contacts within 24 minutes or 24 hours. It didn't make that much a difference in the original uh, or the alpha variant, but it makes a lot of difference for the delta variant. So, four people would like to know if humor can be used to combat against viral and toxic content. Can humor be also used with malicious intent to spread disinformation effectively? It's not that easy, though, uh, because humor, as defined by making fun of the messenger itself, right, making fun of myself, um, self deprecating humor, uh, this form of humor already promotes a release of the tension that could have been used for discrimination or vengefulness, because it's the same um, sense of outrage, but by expressing it through humor, the sense of outrage is, is already gone. You can't easily feel outrage by making fun of yourself. It's really difficult. So unless, of course, just to prove a point, you design the entire uh, kind of black humor uh, comedy um, uh, strip just to prove a point uh, in, in real life, usually if we express things using humor, cute cats and cute dogs and so on, it cannot evoke the same set of mentality like outrage turned into vengefulness and discrimination that would uh, foster this information. Instead, it will foster uh, people making fun of the existing not so perfect 
um, situation. And then it will promote then people to think about how to prevent things like this in the future in a more creative way. So um, I don't rule out a theoretical possibility. And if you want to do that research, more powers to you. But in real life, it's less likely a self-deprecating humor can lead to more outrage and therefore more disinformation. It can lead to, to misinformed misinformation, but it doesn't tend to go viral that way. So four people would like to know, on social media that allows equal participation, those who chat actively usually draw more attention. Do you think this rather creates unequal participation? Certainly, that is certainly the case. The question to ask is whether people who uh, spam, right, other people's attention, whether there is a easy way not to tune them entirely out, but somewhat keeping a distance, uh, mute selectively or dialing the, the noise level down. Now, pretty much all the modern social media systems have some controlled knobs like that, that can uh, save uh, ourselves from a lot of spun from people who chat unusually actively. But uh, one related question though, is that is this the only, um, only way to garner attention? Uh, before broadband as a human right, there is a clear inequality. People who enjoy uh, easy access to broadband broadcasting facilities. I'm thinking about television broadcasters and so on. They have uh, like a uncontested, uncontested position uh, to push high bandwidth <clears throat> information into people's homes and cars through radios and so on. But nowadays, if you are in a jurisdiction where uh, broadband is a human right and it's a fixed price, like in Taiwan, it's less than 16 US dollars a month for unlimited upload, then it suddenly changed the economy. Uh, the way to uh, draw more attention is not to chat more actively, but to provide higher resolution, higher quality, um, either audio via podcasts or video via the short clips and films and things like that, and co-creation and video conferencing uh, and uh, sound uh, meeting rooms and things like that, because for each participant, the marginal cost is now almost, I would say it's, it is zero uh, for more uh, quality input put in. And we do not have to satisfy ourselves into some sarcastic takes uh, through short text and things like that. In fact, I believe the uh, use of video and real-time video conference as a preferred socialization form uh, is a direct function of us adopting the flat rate of around 16 US dollars a month a couple of years ago. And by now, Taiwan definitely prefers video as the primary uh, medium and uh, this incessant uh, text-based chat is uh, no longer the social norm to get more attention. So I, I do believe more bandwidth lead to finer understanding, um, you know, deep fakes notwithstanding, but still uh, real-time interactions, it's still uh, much easier to build rapport, that's to say emotional support, if people can see each other's real-time uh, whereabouts and uh, emotional states uh, clearly, if bandwidth is not a concern for economic uh, disadvantaged people, which it isn't in Taiwan. All right, so I think we're down to the last few questions. Um, so, five people would like to know, what are your views on recent efforts in China or even US and Australia to crack down <clears throat> on big tech companies? Uh, I believe they're following very different logic. So it's impossible to offer a, the same view on these different jurisdictions. Um, I, I would simply say that there's tech and there's technology. Um, just like there's math and there's mathematics. Uh, I, I don't think any jurisdiction is seriously cracking down on technology. I believe they're all pretty much uh, doubling down on investing not just in technological innovation, but also um, like stronger, faster um, together, right? Uh, so higher, faster, stronger tech together. That is to say, making sure all the different sectors have their way to contribute to technology and to innovation. I don't think that's changed. What is changed is 
uh, the social media and social networking systems and the more entertainment focused tech uh, is previously seen as leading the technological innovation, but now are more and more seen as simply uh, profiting from the technological innovations without contributing substantially back to basic research or technology in general. Now, of course, this is a matter of debate. Of, uh, obviously, there is some sponsoring of basic research from the leading big tech. On the other hand, uh, the critiques are probably right in saying that um, <clears throat> if there's no big tech, uh, the same technological uh, progress will happen and also happen in a way that is more equitable to the entire society. So both perspectives have merit because they're not uh, in a zero sum relationship. I think people are just calibrating on the kind of technologies that we need to <clears throat> invest our time in without getting massively distracted by the ex externalities. I'm thinking about the, the polarization of society and so on by the so-called big tech. So this is like I don't know, people discovering that drinking too much coffee is bad for health or smoking too much is bad for health. So it's a, it's a place of, of course, reflection, but I don't think it's entirely writing things off. So I'm pretty sure the US or Australia is like that. Now, I'm less sure about the PRC, but on the other hand, I don't work in the PRC cabinet and very few people actually have a, a, a working full theory of why the recent crackdown, not on tech in general, but on those purely kind of non-national value enhancing tech uh, and how much of this can be uh, recovered through charity contribution and so on. I mean, it's an unfolding story uh, and I'm just reading the news as you are reading the news. I don't claim privileged knowledge on the particular way that the PRC uh, government uh, is working out its new relationship uh, on the so-called big tech companies. So five people would like to know. So Japan is about to, I believe it's already established the Ministry of Digital, the digital agency. Uh, what kind of personnel uh, should be in charge of it? Um, everyone, I mean the citizens. So uh, one of the first things that I did is to promote the joint platform from a ministerial level uh, suggestion box into a interagency level suggestion box so that when new suggestions that obviously cross ministerial boundaries, we don't simply say, thank you, but we don't know how to process this petition. We instead say, okay, Minister Audrey Tang will hold a interagency meeting to figure out uh, who owns eSport, uh, who owns banning of plastic straws in bubble tea, who owns uh, the scams on Facebook and other uh, instant messaging platforms turned into e-commerce platforms and things like that. They're all wildly interagency, but we don't drop the ball uh, just because no agency want to own that matter. So that's literally one of the first things I did uh, through the participation office and network platform. So uh, I do did this not because I'm a good person to be in charge of eSport or plastic straws or whatever, but because I believe the career public service in each and every ministry deserve a chance to hold such interagency meetings without being captured by the existing positions in their ministries. So in a sense, this is a learning community formed by one person each of all the existing participating ministries. So when we talk about the tax filing experience redesign, the person who chair, who uh, are in charge of the discussion group uh, may be the public servants uh, from Ocean Affairs, uh, uh, Ocean Patrol, Sea Patrol. Uh, and when we talk about the Ocean Affairs, like how to open up the surfing places and uh, whether uh, we need to open up the professional fishers wharf to amateur fishers and so on. Well, the person in charge of holding that breakout group may be from the Ministry of uh, Finance uh, or the um, uh, finance uh, supervised community and so on. Uh, and I, I, this is not a gimmick. This is at the core of um, the horizontal leadership model we do. Uh, because when a Ocean uh, Affairs Council officer in charge of Sea Patrol hold the discussion 
on text filing redesign, they will not take the position of the Ministry of Finance. They will take the position of an ordinary citizen filing their tax because they are an ordinary citizen filing their tax. It's just they have public service experience. And conversely, when the Ministry of Finance person holds the discussion on ocean affairs, on surfing, well, they're just a fisher, an amateur fisher or a surfer. They're not a officer of the banking agency, right? So the point here is that if we establish such a cross-cutting horizontal learning situation where the collaboration is chaired by someone who have years and years of public service experience, but no stake in the original ministerial position on this emerging uh, phenomena, then it's the best of both worlds. The citizens who participate in the conversation understand that their concerns are being listened with an empathetic ear because that person takes their side. On the other hand, the uh, colleagues from other ministries understand they would never propose something illegal, something uh, that is entreating, something that violates the norms or the laws, because after all, they are a senior public servant. So uh, facilitating uh, the conversations requires the recruitment, not only of external experts, but also of internal experts put in a very different position. So in my uh, office, uh, slightly over half are public service, um, like career public servants, and slightly less than half are those uh, professional designers, facilitators, and so on from the civil society. I believe this combination has merit to respond to the emerging situation uh, and aligning on the common values, at least something that we can all live with without any personnel uh, giving uh, in charge commands to the other ministry because they represent wildly different worldview that cannot be uh, recombined without the deliberation that includes people as equal partners. I hope that answers the question. It's a long-winded answer, but I believe it's a, it's a core of my theory of change. Um, thank you very much, Mi Minister yes. Audrey Town. And we're at um, time. It's time already. Yes. I'm aware of it. Uh, we shouldn't take more of your time, but <laughs> we are extremely uh, fortunate to have you for three hours. It's just mm -hmm. unimaginable to all of us. And uh, until now, we didn't believe it would happen. And uh, of course, we have been extremely also enriched by all the thoughts and the opinions and your experience. So let's put our hands together with uh, uh, to show our gratitude to Minister Tao. Thank you very much. And uh, we have asked so many questions. Do you have any question to ask us before you leave this room? Yeah, certainly. So um, after uh, listening to, to this, I'm not asking you to answer to me, but I would like to invite you to uh, take anything that you find disappointing or not working as well in your jurisdiction. It doesn't have to be national level. It could be community level. It could be district level and so on. Uh, and think of a, a call to action uh, to, to make it better. Just think of it as an exercise. Now, uh, after uh, you, you did this, I also invite you to maybe post to Twitter and tag me. Uh, but it doesn't have to be Twitter. It could be Facebook, LinkedIn, or, or whatever. And um, may, who, who knows, maybe some of your followers or my followers will look at this call to action and make it better. Mostly, uh, this is just to get us into a mood of working out loud, meaning that uh, we're, of course, studying and making improvements and so on. But uh, very seldom do we get immediate feedback from the social media. Uh, but if you do not feel comfortable with exposing to social media, I'm not forcing you to. I'm sure that the professor or the university or the class <laughs> have some shared accounts that you can use, like the Global Leadership uh, Program account that you can use uh, to post those ideas. And I look forward to more conversations on Twitter or really in any of the ongoing venues with you. Thank you very much. Definitely, we will try to do that. Mm -hmm. And I will keep you updated mm -hmm. about how we are going to do with this mm -hmm. uh, um, three hour long conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it's a gr great regret that you didn't come to Japan mm -hmm. uh, for the Olympics. For the Olympics. Because yes. I, yes, I have to tell you, millions mm -hmm. of Japanese were disappointed. Mm -hmm. So we hope one day you will come back and to our university as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, definitely. And I think again for the Japanese uh, generous donation of AstraZeneca, without which I would not be vaccinated and be able to travel to Japan sometime hopefully before the end of the year. Thank you very much and our best wish to your great job mm -hmm. to serve uh, the people of mm -hmm. Taiwan. Thank you uh, and live long and prosper everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Tang, and uh, for the all participation in our event. And thank you, Professor Ko and all the participants of the uh, University of Tokyo. Tomorrow, class will be invited to National Human Rights Zen and the Britain Thai Bookstore to share their experience. The event will start at 11 o'clock in the morning. And thank you. See you tomorrow. See you. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chen. And the students, um, we will think about how to answer the question uh, Audrey Tang asked us, okay? Um, now let's uh, have a rest and we'll see you all tomorrow at 11.